All right. So I'm Dr. Deborah Hall, and I'm a neurologist. I've been here at Rush for about 10 years, and I'm the new director of the Huntington's Disease Program. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm just so happy uh, to see so many folks who are interested in learning a little bit more about Huntington's disease. So thank you. We welcome you. Um, many of you are patients of our practice, so we're happy to see you on Saturday, and uh, hopefully we can talk through some things we don't have time to talk about in the clinic together. I just wanted to start by um, saying thank you. Uh, so I wanted to thank Melissa, who's in the back. Melissa, please stand up. She organized today. And if you need anything, yes, let's give a round of applause. And I also wanted to introduce um, some other folks in our group. Please stand up if you work in our group and wave. So we have Monica, who's a medical assistant in the Huntington's program. Sarah, who's our nurse in the Huntington's program. Uh, we have Mark Rosenbaum, our genetic counselor, uh, who's full-time in our group. Uh, Teresa Chamura, who's at the research table outside. Uh, we have Sam, who you'll be hearing from, our social worker. Uh, Kristen, who is our nurse manager in the research division. And Georgianne, who's one of our nurses in the clinic as well. So if you are any of those folks, please stand up and wave. If you need anything today, uh, just find one of them and they'd be happy to help you. I also wanted to say thank you to Teva, who's in the hallway. Uh, they uh, provided us with an educational grant today and are very happy uh, to serve the Huntington's community. So I, at last, I wanted to acknowledge HDSA, who is in the room today. If our representatives from HDSA uh, could stand. I think Emily is here. Holly, yes, please wave. So we are happy to have you with us. Uh, we are also partners uh, with HDSA and um, a center of excellence with HDSA. So we're happy to have them here. Yes, welcome. So I just wanted to introduce our first speaker. We are so delighted to have Dr. Kathleen Shannon come back as our keynote speaker today. Uh, many of you in the room may know Dr. Shannon. Uh, so she is a movement disorder neurologist. She did uh, started her um, undergraduate degree at Northwestern and then received her medical degree here at Rush University and did her training here as well. And she served on our faculty here at Rush for 26 years. I think I've got that right. Does that sound right? Uh, do I have that right? Maybe she can add up the years and tell us when she comes up if I got that right. Uh, so she was here. She started and ran the Huntington's disease program here for many years and um, really built the program. And so we are very excited that the program continues. She has taken a very um, esteemed position as chair of neurology at University of Wisconsin. So um, although we've tried to bring her back uh, several times now. Uh, she will likely be in Madison for a little longer, but did agree to come back today to speak with us. And she is also very happy to chat with you if you know her um, over the breaks as well. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Shannon. She's gonna talk to us today about research in Huntington's disease. All right. Is that one? Okay. Well, thanks, Deborah. Uh, so happy to be here. I really miss all of my wonderful Huntington's patients here. I'm building a nice program there, but you never forget the people who uh, you learned from and took care of uh, in the early days, and then also the family members that have been such um, important partners in, in care of Huntington's patients. So. Um, and thank you, Deborah, for inviting me back to do this ta uh, talk. You, I know the people in this room, including all of the, the professional people in the room, are really excited about what's happening in research in Huntington's disease now. So I'm just going to give you kind of an overview, highlighting the stuff that I think is really current. And then I want to talk a little bit about research participation at the end. So um, Blaise Pascal, who lived in the 1600s, this is a quote from him, which I think is just remarkable from someone in the 1600s. That man lives between the infinitely large and the infinitely small. And so we have our universe. Uh, yes. There we go. Uh, the universe, which you know, started um, 14 billion years ago, and we can only see the things in the universe that are 14 billion light years away because we can only pick up their the far things by their electronic electric, uh, electromagnetic radiation, and that takes that comes at the speed of light, and so you can only see 
uh, 14 billion light years uh, away, so it's much bigger than that, but so enormous beyond anyone's comprehension. And then at the same time, the kind of microscopic, which is now, this is actually scanning tunneling microscope, which is able to see DNA. This is DNA. It's what DNA looks like, and this is what it looks like under the scanning tunneling microscope, which is remarkable to see DNA. So just so the, uh, to, to let you know that we are going to talk about things from the person to the cell and beneath the cell. So, um, oh, my introductory slide didn't make it in. Sorry, Deborah. Um, so uh, Deborah wanted me to just make sure that everyone in the room is on the same page about Huntington's disease. So it's an inherited, dominantly inherited condition, which means you only need one abnormal gene, which means that if your parent has Huntington's disease, your risk is 50-50. I'm sure the people in this room are well familiar with that story. It's a neurodegenerative disease, which means that it's caused by progressive death of certain groups of brain cells. And the symptoms that you have are the results of losing the brain cells that would keep you from having those symptoms. Um, and it usually starts around the age in the 30s or 40s, but it can start the youngest patient I ever saw was five years old at onset. And I just diagnosed a woman day before yesterday who is 79 at onset. And she'll be the first person in her family diagnosed, although there were some suspicious uh, symptoms in other family members. Um, and the average survival is about 17 years, 17 to 20 years, but that's uh, been changed because we take better care of patients and it may change with some of these new treatments that we're looking at. This is the first description in 1872 by George Huntington. It's the only thing he ever described. It's a brilliant description. Um, this is the Venezuela, part of the Venezuela kindred. So there's some family in Venezuela, some, uh, all the descendants of a woman who lived there 200 years ago, and she had Huntington's disease. And so it's a very, uh, very, very prevalent condition. There are lots of patients. And this is the family, actually, these are the families that the gene was discovered in 1993. So it's a very important family. We've known for a long time that the brain shrinks in Huntington's disease, and especially the area right here. So these are the ventricles where the spinal fluid is, and this area right here is called the caudate nucleus, and that shrinks. And we've also known for a long time that there's a lot of scarring in this area of the brain. So this is a healthy brain, and all this brown is scar tissue in the brain. Um, and then, but newer um, imaging is showing uh, things instead of just a structural MRI. So we don't usually get MRIs in people with Huntington's disease unless we think something else is going on because they're not particularly helpful. They just show that shrinkage that we already know is there. But newer imaging techniques uh, are looking at um, kind of the pathways in the brain, how, the, how uh, intact those are. So now we're able to look at people in a completely different way. We're able to look at brain function with these. Uh, imaging study. So lots, lots been going on at the at the full person level. And then now we're looking at, um, this is a view from the front, as if the front of your skull was cut off and you're looking back to the brain. And here again are these, what are called the ventricles, where the spinal fluid is made. And this is a normal healthy brain. And here is, and this is the caudate, what I told you before, healthy. And this is the part that's most affected in Huntington. So the earliest changes in the brain occur here. And even we know that they occur in a certain kind of, of brain cells called medium spiny neurons. And this is a nice picture because it shows you what the brain cells look like. There's a cell body where the DNA is and all the really important stuff. And then very long projections that allow the cells to contact other cells and communicate with them. So, um, so in Huntington's disease, one of the, probably the best thing about Huntington's disease what, how to put that sentence together, but the be, probably the best thing is that every single person with Huntington's has the exact same mutation. That's not true of every genetic disease. There are some genetic diseases where there are hundreds of different mistakes in the DNA that cause the same gene, uh, same disease. But in Huntington's, it's one gene, same gene in every person, and the exact same problem with every, with every person, which makes it a very easy uh, thing to study uh, as far as mechanisms go, because you can create that, that disease in animals by putting the gene in, for example. So, and the, and the abnormality in the gene is, so this is a normal um, gene, gene without Huntington's disease, and it's an area where the genetic code is repeated. So we need to talk a little bit about the genetic code. So D DNA contains a um, series of chemicals called nucleotides. And um, CAG, or CAG, when you hear your repeat number, is referring to the trinucleotide repeat. So three different, so tri for three nucleotide, three different nucleotides in a row. And each one of these little trinucleotides codes for an amino acid and a protein. That's how this gene works. 
So the gene has the recipe for which amino acids need to be lined up where in order to make the protein. And this particular protein has a long stretch of the, of the amino acid glutamine, and the code for glutamine is CAG, CAG. That's the code. So every time there's a CAG in the DNA, there is a glutamine in the protein. And normal genes have under 35, in fact, most normal genes, this Huntington gene, most of them have 17, 18, 19, 20 repeats. And so that protein has 17, 18, 19, 20 glutamines in a row. But in Huntington's disease, as soon as you get to uh, 36, then you start, some people, some people will get sick at that number. So having 36 or more repeats is not normal in that gene. That causes a protein that has 36 or more glutamine repeats, which makes it a longer protein. It's also a stickier protein, so it sticks together. It sticks to other things. It clumps up in the cells, and it wreaks havoc within the cells. So this picture here is the, um, this is the code here. So here's the, where the CAG starts, the yellow ones. And it shows you that each one of these CAG is causing a glutamine in the protein. There are other genetic disorders like this, neurological disorders, where this CAG repeat happening and those proteins have too much uh, glutamine in them too. Uh, this just happens to be in this protein called Huntington. All right. So the first thing you're doing when you're trying to research a disease is figure out what's going wrong in the cells. And the fact is that lots of things are going wrong in the Huntington cells. So this is a cartoon here of um, the cell. So again, this is the cell body where the DNA lives. Uh, that's here, the nucleus is where the DNA is. And then there's all kinds of machinery out in, the, uh, in the, the cytoplasm outside the nucleus. And then you can see these long, some of these long processes going out where the cell is going to hook up with other cells. So think of a cell as like your house. It's got boundaries to keep things out and keep things in. It has uh, energy production. It has cleanup functions. It has repair. You, know, you have to repair it. And, and so what happens when you have this abnormal protein is it starts to interfere with virtually all those things. It actually interferes with how the DNA for other genes is processed. So it can interfere with other kind of proteins that should be being made. It interferes with energy production. Um, it causes all kinds of problems. And I don't want to go over each one of these things in the slide, but this shows all different areas where things in the cell are going wrong. And each one of these boxes, and those are called targets, so a process that's going wrong is a target. And each one of these boxes here is um, a, a potentially experimental treatment for that. So it's a drug or some kind of intervention that acts on that target. So once you find a target, then you find drugs that do what you want to to that target. Things, for example, that increase energy production if your cells aren't producing energy properly. And then you do testing on them. And we'll finish up with how that, how that all happens. So the, the main problem, though, is the DNA mutation and a protein that has too many glutamines in it. It's called a mutant protein. And this protein <clears throat> acquires what's called a toxic gain of function. So in some genetic diseases, a protein's made that doesn't work. So those people might have a deficiency of an enzyme, for example. But in Huntington's disease and several other degenerative nervous system diseases, the protein is actually toxic. So theoretically, then, if you can prevent that protein from being made, you should be able to prevent the toxicity from happening. So that the big focus of this talk is really on how to do that. Um, and um, so th that's the cartoon. These are the things that, that are going wrong. So transcription dysregulation. So that's transcription is how the genes are copied in order to, to for the proteins to be manufactured. So some genes then can't express their proteins. Synaptic dysfunction. So at the ends of those long processes are called synapses, the areas where cells contact each other. And you have problems there. So the cells can't communicate. Uh, there's alteration in movement of things between the cells. So things have to go all the way to the end of those long processes, and they can't, can't go. Um, there's impaired regulation of proteins. The, the mutant protein, the sticky long protein, creates clumps called aggregates. Um, there is difficulty in how the nucleus, where the DNA is, controls things coming into it and out of it. That's called the nuclear core, core complex problems. There's oxidative damage, so that's hungry oxygen molecules causing, we think of it as brain rust. Uh, the oxygen atta attacks healthy structures and damages them. There's mitochondrial dysfunction. The mitochondrion is the energy generator in your cells. That doesn't work very well. And then <clears throat> um, because the uh, cell isn't able to protect itself very well, excitatory chemicals from other brain cells will come and damage the cells. So there's all these different targets. And in fact, most of them have been studied in one way or another with drugs. 
So this is just a list of some of the studies that have been done that have shown not to help with Huntington's disease. So um, targeting inflammation or trying to increase energy or uh, stop that brain rust, uh, decrease excitation, all these things have been tried and failed. But I want you to look at this third column here because in order to find out that something works for Huntington's disease, in other words, in order to find out whether something slows down the progression of the illness, you need a very large study. So really only these top uh, four studies were big enough to actually show something worked. The other ones failed for some other reason, they weren't tolerable or didn't seem to be a signal that it would work, uh, but it was only really the first. For There haven't been that many big, large studies of Huntington's disease. Um, so we're going to talk, um, so because, here we go. So this is that same cartoon I showed you with all these things going wrong. I just circled here. So here is the nucleus. Here's the DNA. Uh, and then here's the protein. So the goal of all of the recent excitement of, uh, about research in Huntington's disease is trying to reduce that protein. If you can get rid of the toxic protein, you should be able to do something to slow disease progression. Um, you may not be able to reverse what's already happened, but you should be able to slow the progression. So, that, so we're concentrating really on that area. And now we're, um, this is kind of complicated. So this, this here is the nucleus. This is the DNA. This is the DNA mutation here. And transcription is the process of copying DNA so that it can, the message can be sent to the protein manufacturing equipment outside the nucleus. And that's called messenger RNA. So in the nucleus, it's pre-messenger RNA, and then it comes out, and then it's uh, RNA. And the RNA, so that has the actual, the actual sequence from the DNA. It's a copy. And then that's what um, allows the selection of the right amino acids to make the protein. So there are several different approaches. So one is uh, you, can, you can alter the DNA sequence, several different things that you can do. The one that's most commonly known and you might hear about is CRISPR, which is a gene editing kind of program. Um, there's, other, there's some other ones called zinc finger protein and Talens. These are other ones. All of these things are not in human trials yet. These are things that are being done in animals. So we're not really going to talk about that. Um, there are some other things that can happen um, in altering the, the message, so change the message instead of the DNA. But the things we're going to talk about are antisense oligonucleotide and, interf and RNA interference. So these are things that target the um, messenger RNA. So DNA has the code. Messenger RNA is the copy of that code. That goes out. So the goal is to get rid of that messenger RNA so that the protein can't be made. That makes sense? Yes. OK, good. So one of the most important things that had to happen before starting these studies is we needed to find some, something to measure. It takes a long time for Huntington's disease to change. It takes a long time in a study to follow people and determine that your treatment is working. So if you have something to measure that your treatment is actually doing what you want it to do, that's great. So this is um, what happened there. The really important breakthrough is it became possible to measure the amount of abnormal protein in the spinal fluid. So the spinal fluid is made in those deep cavities in the brain and then it goes, circulates all around, down and around your spine, up around the surfaces of your brain. And, uh, and so if you can measure the protein, and if the protein is high, then now you have something to measure to see if your treatment's working. So this was a huge breakthrough. And so um, in this study, these are, oops, sorry. Um, these are people, so these are healthy control people. And this axis is the uh, amount of protein. And then, so high is worse, more protein, more mutant protein. These are healthy controls. They don't have any mutant protein. These are people who have the gene, but they aren't sick yet they have higher protein levels than the healthy people. These are people who have early Huntington's disease, early to mid, and then these are people who have late. Now you notice that the protein level goes down in late Huntington's disease. It's simply because there's not as much brain tissue. Uh, to, so you just don't get as much protein. Um, so, and then um, in animals, you can see if that spinal fluid protein level is a good measure of the protein levels in the brain. Because the goal is to reduce the protein levels in the brain. We want to use this to measure it. We need to know that there's a correlation. And so this axis here is the brain protein, and this axis is the cerebral spinal fluid, spinal fluid protein. And this is a, you can see that the higher the brain protein, the higher the mutant protein. 
And it's a linear, it's a very good relationship. So it's a, it's a reliable, uh, very reliable. Um, so I'm just going to talk briefly about the DNA approaches. I told you there are things called zinc finger transcription factors. These are in preclinical testing, meaning animal testing. Um, they aren't, um, one of the issues that we need to work out in this research is whether blocking all of the protein, so even the normal protein, whether that's safe. Obviously, the normal protein's there for a reason. Um, it's not clear that adults need the protein as much as developing uh, fetuses, but, um, and, and most of the things that are being studied, some of them are not selective. So when it says CAG repeat here, it just means that anything with CAG repeat. So the normal protein, potentially other proteins that also have CAG repeats, for example. Um, so these are things that actually attach, these ones up here, zinc finger transcription factors attached to the DNA and then prevent it from being transcribed from their copying. Um, and again, they're in preclinical studies, and they have to be delivered by gene therapy, which means you have to get a virus, put the gene that makes these things there into the virus, inject the virus into the brain, the virus infects the brain cells, and now they produce the treatment. The problem with that is that you can't undo it. Since it's in your gene, it's in there forever. So you have to be very careful with that kind of research. And CRISPR is the same thing. It's a different mechanism. Um, it's a little molecular scissors that can snip out and replace parts of the gene. This is permanent, so it would potentially only be a single treatment. But again, it's not, not reversible. So if something goes wrong, it's wrong forever. Most of the work now is on antisense oligonucleotides and small interfering RNA. So I'm going to talk about those two things. So in the, uh, again, this is the DNA here. It's being turned into this messenger, so the it's being copied and it's whoops being turned into messenger. Oh, I'm so sorry. There we go. Messenger RNA and then a protein. And this antisense oligonucleotide is a it's a manufactured string of nucleotides that is made to pair up with the messenger RNA. So it's it's you know use the CAG to create a thing that just matches up and it attaches to the messenger RNA. And when, it's, when the messenger RNA is attached to this, it gets degraded. It's the same thing with small interfering RNA. These two techniques, antisense oligonucleotides, small interfering RNA, both make the message, the mutant message, degrade. And so then you can't make the protein. Does that make sense? All right, we're moving along. So, so these are the approaches. So the first one, and this was really exciting. So this is the Ionis Roche study. It's a phase 1-2A study with 46 patients in Germany, the United Kingdom, and Canada. No patients here. And um, so this is the, the thing about uh, antisense oligonucleotides is that they will, if you, if you get them close to the brain tissue, they can penetrate the brain cells and go in. So they don't need to be delivered by a virus. They, that way you can, you can give it in the spinal fluid. The spinal fluid, as I told you, bathes the whole brain. And so then that treatment gets into the brain cells. Um, through the, so, so that makes it very desirable because spinal taps are easy, in fact. <laughs> Some people don't think they are, but they are easy. Um, so it's um, this first one, the Anis Roche, um, I'm going to show you the data from that study, but um, it's a single drug for anyone. And it's a single drug that can be used for anyone because it targets both the mutant DNA and the, the normal DNA. And as I said, one of the unanswered questions now is if there's a harmful effect of targeting the normal, normal DNA, the normal protein. We will only find that out by doing the studies. In some animal studies, um, there are some effects of, the, of reducing the, the normal protein. Um, so then uh, this Wave Pharmaceuticals also has a study. It's also an antisense oligonucleotide, but it takes advantage of little differences in the genetic code that happen right before the mutation. So different people have a little bit of a different code right before the mutation. And so this, uh, these people looked at all the different little uh, changes before the mutation and found two different ones that can be used that target about two thirds of patients. So about two thirds of patients will have one or the other, this little bit of information. And so this, this wave antisense oligonucleotide is just like, is just like the Ionis Roche one, but it can target only the mutant strand. So they run your DNA, they see which little conversation is going on before your particular mutation, and then they give you that one that targets that one. Um, so this, these studies are just uh, getting going. 
Um, and again, this is intrathecal, meaning given by a spinal tap. It's targeted, SNP, you see these little differences in conversation before the mutation are called SNPs. It's SNP sensitive. Um, and there are several drugs. You probably, there, you might need five different versions of this to get everyone's, be able to treat everyone. And two of them are uh, entering testing. And then there's another uh, company called Biomarin that's uh, got another one that, um, I don't know all the details for this drug, but it's uh, selective, but they think that one drug will be able to target everyone. So this could even be a better solution. Um, so, this is the Ionis Roche study, the 46-person study. Uh, so these patients had a little screening period where they had a lot of metrics of how their disease was affecting them. They came in, oh, golly. <laughs> I've gotten dumber since I left. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> about every month they come in, they have a spinal tap. And the nice thing about, the other nice thing about the spinal tap is you do the spinal tap, you take fluid out, send it to the lab to measure the protein, inject the, the next treatment. So they got monthly injections uh, over a period of 141 weeks or so. And uh, these, this is a, these are kind of small pictures, but I think you can see the gist. So this is uh, different doses. So this is placebo. This is uh, 10 milligrams, 30 milligrams, 60, 90, and 120 milligrams. And you can see that the lowest dose didn't do anything uh, to, the, to the protein. So what we're expecting in the spinal fluid, if you, um, if you, if you block the protein, um, anyway, we're expecting an increase in these numbers based on the, the higher dose. That's what's happening here. And uh, let's just go on to the next slide. All right. So anyway, the, the results of that study, 46 patients, were that there was a dose-related uh, decrease in the mutant protein in patients who were treated with the active drug. And that the dose of around 90 milligrams was a, gave a really good uh, penetration. And then at the end of the month, it was still, the, the protein was still reduced in the spinal fluid. So um, they were able to now, in the new study they've designed, go longer than a month between, uh, in, they're going to go longer than a month in between injections. So what was the downside of this? So almost everyone in a, in a clinical trial has a side effect, even if they're on placebo. So in this case, the placebo patients had 100% of them had side effects, almost the same number for the active drug. Most of them are related to the spinal tap, like pain where you got the injections or sometimes a headache after you've had it. And then other things related uh, to the disease, like falling. And then, uh, and then colds and headaches. So this is a very good safety profile. There are only two little signals that are potentially worrisome in this initial study. One is that the ventricles got bigger in these patients, and that usually means more brain shrinkage because as the brain shrinks, the ventricles fill to expand that space. Uh, and then there's another thing that's called neurofilament light, which is a, um, a protein that reflects injury to the brain, and that went up a little bit, but no, no clinically significant side effects. They also looked at their data. Now, it's a very small study, 46 patients, not really... Um, good enough to uh, say something works. And a post hoc analysis means you get all your data and start sifting through it and looking for things. And that's not considered to be high quality science, but this kind of, of analysis can give you a signal of whether something seems like it's doing what you want it to. And so in this, uh, in this post hoc analysis, they did, did find that the motor scores, the Huntington, Unified Huntington's Disease Rating Scale, which is what we measure to know how severe the disease is, that was a little bit better. And that the as the hunt, as the spinal fluid Huntington protein went mutant protein went down, also the motor scores went down. So the spinal fluid improved and the patients improved. And that's very tantalizing. It's just not conclusive proof. Um, all right. So just a little bit about RNA inter interference. So this is the same, it's basically it's a different mechanism, but it targets the same messenger RNA and results in messenger RNA being degraded. So not able then to make the protein. And so there are several different approaches here, and they're all preclinical, although this uh, Unicure, which will be done here at Rush next year, at one of the sites, uh, is going to be entering human clinical trials. So this one, unlike the antisense oligonucleotide, which can move from the spinal fluid into the brain cells, this one has to be delivered by a virus. So this is gene therapy. So again, you take the 
genetic information for making this treatment and you put it in a virus, you take all the bad virus stuff out of the virus so you don't get any, you just get, and the virus delivers, the way viruses work is they insert their DNA into your DNA, that's how they make you sick. So this virus then inserts the DNA into the, your DNA and then your DNA makes the treatment. DNA is making your own treatment. It's brilliant. Um, there are some potential problems. One of them is, as I told you, you can't undo it. You can't take it away. You can't go in and fix the DNA, as far as we know. And then uh, also, um, sometimes this is uh, the virus can create an um, immune reaction, like viruses do, so your body can react against that, so there can be inflammation. And also, if the treatment stops working and you need to give it again, that immunity that you've developed might prevent it from working. So your immune system might attack that virus the second time it came in. So again, human trials are needed. And then uh, there's another uh, technique called small molecule splicing modulators. The beauty of this therapy, this is in, uh, also in um, animals, it's oral. It could be a pill, but far away from, uh, from testing. And there are some other um, things that are going to be looked at, so modifying other genes, et cetera. Uh, so this, the, just because we're very interested in these things doesn't mean we can ignore all the other potential treatments. So now I want any questions about that? All right. I just want to talk a little bit about clinical research uh, because people don't, it's very hard when you're, when the news box is talking to you and telling you about some miracle to interpret the significance of that miracle. So it helps to know what clinical trials are all about. So a cl clinical research, it means research in people, simply. A clinical, and that can be, you know, getting, on, getting autopsies and looking at brain tissue or checking blood. I mean, there's lots of different kinds of clinical research. A clinical trial is a research study that prospectively, in advance, assigns human beings or groups of human beings to one or more health-related intervention and that can be an exercise or a drug or just something, or surgery, um, to evaluate the effects on the health outcome. So there's lots of different kinds of clinical trials, but the, we're going to be talking about interventional clinical trials where people are assigned to an intervention or a placebo, and then data are collected to see uh, whether the treatment works. So uh, clinical research is how new knowledge is generated, and they help to find new treatments. And they can't be done without participants. But being a participant is not for everyone. Um, so it has something that people have to decide to do. And it's hard work for the patients. It's hard work for the researchers as well. And um, it takes a lot of clinical trials to get to one drug. So this is not Huntington specific, but this is from um, FDA website actually that shows how many years from discovery. So discovery means we found a target in the, in the cells. We have a drug that looks like it's gonna engage that target. And then it has to go through preclinical testing in the laboratory, kind of chemical testing, a lot of animal testing. And then it goes into phase one, which is usually when the, the, these are the first people to get a drug, usually want to see how much they can tolerate, what kind of side effects, what kind of doses you can use. A lot of times these are normal people who are research participants, uh, paid research participants often. And then it goes into phase two. So phase two testing is usually small numbers of people. In Huntington's disease, it's going to be less than 100 people sometimes less than 50 people. So for example, that first Dianus Roche study, 46 people. And you can't tell in a disease like Huntington's from 46 people whether something's gonna work. It will never prove that something works, but it will tell you what kind of side effects people have, what kind of doses they tolerate. Uh, so that's the purpose of those. And then you can't get approved based on phase two trials. You have to do a phase three trial. Now, depending on what you're studying, these can include thousands of people. In Huntington's disease, they generally include somewhere less than 1,000 people. And in these patients, they have to be randomized either to placebo or in some cases, not Huntington's, if there's an effective treatment on the market, they could be on the, on the one that's already on the market or randomly assigned to a, the treatment that you're studying. And then um, you get a real good... Uh, understanding of how the dr drugs tolerated, what kind of side effects people have, and you're able to collect the data that will allow you to prove to the FDA that your drug works. The whole goal is proving to the FDA that your drug works. And then after it's approved, and that takes a little while, the FDA is getting much faster at this now, then sometimes there'll be additional tests. So a, a drug that's on the, on the market for high blood pressure could be studied in hair loss, for example. And so that's called phase four. So it's an approved drug being studied for some other reason. And just, this is the, these are very sobering. So for every five to 10,000 discovered potential treatments, 
one gets approved by the FDA. And only five of those ever get to the human clinical trial. And this is trial stage, and this is why research is so expensive. It takes forever, and a lot of uh, animals and people along the way. There's huge oversight for clinical trials to make sure that the rights of research subjects are protected. Um, at the federal level, there are several different um, organizations, FDA here, National Institutes of Health, um, Office of Human Research Protections. And then at the local level, there's uh, every university has their own built-in protections, um, which we'll get to in a sec. So this is just a summary of the phases that I told you about before. Um, so for the Food and Drug Administration to approve a new drug, it has to be shown to be safe and effective. Substantial evidence of effectiveness demonstrated through controlled clinical trials. That means randomized, like the flip of a coin, double blind, meaning the investigator, me, doesn't know whether the person's on the active treatment of placebo, and the person doesn't know whether they're on the active treatment of the placebo. Um, placebo controlled, so something that looks, tastes, smells, is identical to the treatment in every way, so including injecting a fluid into the spinal canal for the uh, antisense oligonucleotide trials, um, are typically required. The FDA usually requires two large uh, phase three studies to approve a drug. And the developer of the treatment has to prove that the benefits outweigh the risks. So all drugs have risks. It's the help that the patients get enough to outweigh any potential risks. And then they also review the package insert to make sure that it's accurate, appropriate, and complete. And then after the drug is approved, they actually review the plants that make the drugs to make sure that they're making it properly and under sanitary conditions, for example. So it's a very, it covers the whole process. So if your approach to being in a clinical trial, the first thing you'll, the first thing that happens is the investigator who's doing that clinical trial will have a clinical trial protocol. Protocol has every single step, who's eligible, in the, eligible to be in the study, who's not eligible. Everything that happens, how long it takes, what the potential risks and discomforts of that thing is, what the purpose of the study is, the background, why are we studying this, uh, the research methods, so the design, as I said, usually a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study, the population who gets to be in the study, so for example, the Ionis Roche study, very, very early patients, so not moderately impaired patients, not severely impaired patients, Severely impaired, impaired patients, just early patients. And then exclusion criteria. If you're taking a medicine that would interfere with the treatment or make it unsafe. Uh, if you have other illnesses that might make it, like cancer, where you're taking real toxic medicines, for example. The intervention, what's the dose, how often you take it, how you take it, and then what the assessments are. Everything we're going to measure, that all has to be specified in advance. Uh, and then that's approved by the FDA, if it's an FDA trial, which most clinical trials are. And then at the individual universities, so here at Rush University Medical Center, there are IRBs, University of Wisconsin, there are IRBs, it's an institutional review board. These are groups that are formally designated to review every study that's done at that university. And this says biomedical research involving human subjects, they also approve. There are other uh, committees that also approve animal research. And um, and there has to be written assurance. We have to assure the government that we are going to comply with all the regulations. And then they approve the protocol. And then if there are any changes in the protocol that happen, they have to approve all of those. And then every year they have to approve every protocol again. These um, groups are made up of scientists, but they're also made up of attorneys, other people that work in the medical center, medical center and even community volunteers. So community volunteers can come and be on an IRB and help with this process. Um, this is what, uh, in every clinical trial protocol, we'll have a table like this. And this first column is everything that happens. So the first line up here is, is the person eligible? Did you get consent is the second line. And then it tells uh, each visit, it's if it's a telephone visit or an in-person visit, exactly what happens. That has to be followed rigorously. You can't deviate from those protocols. And then every protocol has an informed consent. This is the first thing you see. And it's like a 25-page document. And it says, it has, to, it has to say by federal regulation that it's research, why you're doing the research, how long it's going to take, what are the procedures, uh, uh, and what, what do we know about the experimental procedures? Can we say that there are predictable risks? What kind of discomforts do we think you'll have? What are the benefits? Are there any alternatives? Is there some other drug on the market that would do just as good for you? Uh, how we keep your information confidential, especially important in genetic diseases. Um, the data will all be confidential. The FDA can inspect the records and they have access to your name and, and uh, identifiers. 
but they're held to the confidentiality standards as well. Whether you get any compensation if you're injured or whether you get uh, 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 treatment, whether that institution will provide treatment for your illness or injury. Um, how to get answers, who do you call if you have a question? What are your rights as a research subject? Uh, and that research is voluntary. And uh, everyone has the right to refuse. So even if you're right in the middle of the spinal tap, you go, wait a minute, I don't want to be in this study anymore. You have the right to leave the study for any reason. Uh, you don't lose any benefits. You can still come to your doctors and get the same kind of treatment. You can contact if you need information for the, exact, for the individual study. Whether if you're a woman of childbearing age or even a man who's uh, planning on having children, uh, what the risks might be to your unborn fetus. Uh, it has to have reasons that we might stop the study. So even if you're feeling great, you're loving the study, we may say we have to stop the study. We have to tell you what reasons that might be. If it's going to cost you anything more to participate. And then if you decide that you want to leave the study, are there any potential consequences? So could something adverse happen because you stopped the treatment suddenly? And then it always has to have a statement that if we learn something new about your disease or if another treatment becomes available, we have to tell you that. We can't keep you in a study and not, not, not inform you that there are other things available. And then they also require that you know how many people are in the study. Now, um, a lot of times people want to, you know, you want to know where the studies are and what's happening. And there are a couple of really good resources. So this is clinicaltrials.gov. This is a government program of our US government, government website. And what happened here was for a while, people would do studies and then they would publish them. And what they would do is they collect a bunch of data and then they would pour through the data to find something that was significant called data mining. And then they would report that. And that's not considered good science. You need to decide ahead of time what you're gonna measure. We want to show that we can slow the progression of this rating scale by 20%. That's what we wanna show. This is the data we're gonna collect. This is how we're going to analyze it to show that. And so um, the editors of all the journals got together and said, we're just not going to publish these anymore unless we know in advance what the plan was. What are they planning to measure? And what are they defining as success? And so this website now is where all these trials are registered. So every single study in the whole world, because they want to be published, is registered at this. So it's a great place to go and look. You can look at a map and see where all the studies are uh, happening. Uh, I see a lot of them in the US. Um, Many studies now are multinational. So for example, the new uh, Roche Genentech trial, the ASO trial is multinational. And so I just picked some from, and what happens is you can look at it in a table too, and you can click on it. You can see where the study is being done, who to contact if you want to participate, you know, who's eligible for the study. You can read everything about it. And I, for example, have a patient in Wisconsin who's now traveled to Toledo for three years, every three months for one study. And now he's trying to, flying to Seattle to be in the antisense oligonucleotide trial, and he found those places and contacted the people uh, to get enrolled in those. So there's a bunch of things being studied. So this is a uh, stem cell thing in Brazil, um, deep brain stimulation. This is a drug that helps your cells remove uh, abnormal proteins. It's uh, not exactly clear what this is in China, symptomatic therapy, uh, an anti uh, kind of anti-inflammatory medication, exercise studies. This is the extension study. So often if you're in a study that's planned to last two years, you want to say, well, what happens to me at the end of the two years? What if I'm doing better? Many drug companies will have an extension study where everyone's able to go on to the active treatment at the end of the original study. So that's this one. This is the, whoops, that's the one for the 46 people who were in the original study. And then anyone who graduates from the current study will be able to go into there. So they're anticipating as many as 950 people in that study eventually. And then another kind of oral solution as well. So you can look on that and read. These are the, this is the new, um, so Ionis merged with Roche and now Genentech's involved. So it's, the drug has had more than one, cha one name change. Um, and this one is the one that people are enrolling in now. This is 660 subjects. So this study is powered to detect a significant change. It takes 660 patients followed for a year or two years to know that you can demonstrate a change. It's remarkable, really. Um, so this is a multinational study. And then these are the wave ones. These are the ones that target only the mutant Huntington protein. And then there's some things for symptoms, like this is one for irritability. Example. 
Um, but, but most of the focus, I would say, are on these antisense allergen trials now. So that's the clinicaltrials.gov. This is hdtrials.org. So hdtrials.org adds something to this. You can go on to hdtrials.org and you can type in your information, how long you've had Huntington's, your age, or whatever. And then you, f you fill out a questionnaire and then they can search the trials and send you a personalized kind of report about what trials you might be eligible for and then who you can contact for information. So that's very simple, hdtrials.org. Um, and you can also search, so they can, they'll, you can enter your stuff or you can just search and you can search by zip code if you wanna see what's near hear you. Um, and I mentioned that my patient in Wisconsin is fine to Seattle. Many studies uh, will pay for transportation for a patient and a caregiver. if They are really working hard to recruit patients. So it's always, even if it's out of town, it's always worth kind of contacting them and saying, you know, would you pay for me to come? I always have to put a slide in like this because, you know, anti-animal research is a big thing now. People sometimes think, well, yeah, that's terrible that the mice are being researched on. If you want your diseases cured, you absolutely have to advocate for animal research. That's the only way we're ever gonna cure any diseases in this country is through animal research. So uh, you need to be on that side of the argument. And now, if you're feeling like this, you've been paying attention the whole time. And now uh, we have maybe a few minutes for questions. Um, that's a that's a pretty vague. Uh, I'm not sh uh, the only one I know of is the antisense oligonucleotide in the UK. Yeah, does anyone has anyone heard about that or know something more about that? You don't know what kind of a drug it is. Testing. Um, hard to say. Well, I asked. I had heard about a drug in the UK that was. Uh, had some good effects, and yeah. I was just trying to find yeah. out more information about it. Yeah, so none of the things that I've showed you today have had any proven good effects. So, I mean, it might be, you know, it's like a hint. It's like from the first antisensoglonucleotide trial, a hint that maybe some of those scores get better. That's not, that's not enough to say. It would be on clinicaltrials.gov, though. What stops us from doing like a dialysis on the spinal fluid to stop the aggregation of the mutant Huntington protein? Well, see, the protein is aggregating in the brain cells. You'd have to do a dialysis on the brain cells. Uh, and and, they, and um, the problem is once it's all aggregated in there, you can't, you have to find a way to get it out. So the antisense oligonucleotides is the way to stop it accumulating. We don't know a way to, to get it out. Um, the kinds of things that are potentially being looked at for that. So there are, there are two strategies. One is to enhance the cell's own drug recycling capacity. So there's something called autophagy where this, the cells actually, you make every, pro, your cells make every protein they need every day. They're constantly making protein. And then those proteins are getting worn out and used up and damaged and they're recycled. So there's a process in the cells like a garbage disposal that munches up all that protein. Um, so one approach would be to use a drug that, that increases the efficiency of that. And so this nilotinib that I showed you, this one that's being studied at Georgetown, that study is 12 patients. That's not enough to learn anything from. Um, but that's potentially a way to do that. And the other way is to make a monoclonal antibody, so an antibody that attaches to the protein. It's able to get to the protein in the cells. And then your immune system come and take the antibody and the protein away. Um, so that's not, I don't know that anyone's developing that for Huntington's yet. There are talks of drugs like that for Parkinson's disease, for example, which is a similar protein-based degenerative disease, but not quite. Because again, the thing about Huntington's is everyone's got the same mutation. So you can target the DNA and the RNA, and you don't have to have a more nonspecific way of targeting the protein. Does that make sense? Yeah, we'll have a panel right on time, I think. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Shannon. She'll also be on our panel. So if you have a question, write it down now because the panel will be in a little while and you don't want to forget your question. There's some cards on the table. So I'd next like to introduce Dr. Charlotte Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson is a neuropsychologist who works in the Rush Group. Many of you may have met her. 
Uh, she does a host of services in our group, including testing, uh, memory and thinking, and also counseling. So, Dr. Anderson. Thank you. Good morning. Um, glad to see all of your faces here today and I'm glad to be able to present some of this information um, because what I do, um, a lot of people don't know what a neuropsychological evaluation is or what it's for. So um, I enjoy explaining to patients um, a little bit more about what their care involves and, and what we're looking at. Um, let me make sure I know how to work this clicker. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so I've been at Rush here for about um, five years almost, and um, I've been part of the Huntington's Clinic since the beginning. Um, and if you um, have met myself or my colleague, Dr. Brian Bernard, who does the same thing, um, if you were new in our clinic, you might have um, had a neuropsych evaluation on your very first day. Sometimes we wait till later, but um, if not, that's okay. If you're interested in having one and you haven't had one, then um, please just talk to your provider. You can talk to me afterwards. Um, so Huntington's disease symptoms fall into three major categories. Um, motor symptoms, which are the, um, the way that your muscles move, the way that your body moves. Cognitive symptoms, which include the way that you think, your memory, your reasoning, your attention skills, and psychiatric symptoms, which often involves um, um, your mood. So that's when we're talking about things like depression or anxiety. Sometimes when we're talking about a little bit more serious psychiatric issues like um, maybe paranoia, which is like an extreme version of anxiety um, and um, delusions and things like that. So um, HD symptoms fall into these three categories, but the diagnosis is made when motor symptoms um, show up, when those start. But um, oftentimes the cognitive and psychiatric symptoms can impair functioning um, early on in the disease, maybe even before the motor symptoms are real obvious or become, become a, a problem in your day-to-day -day life. Um, and the cognitive and psychiatric things can sometimes cause problems at work or at home. There might be subtle changes in, um, in the way a patient interacts with other people or how they're able to perform their job functions. Um, so those can show up early on. So let's talk in a little bit more detail about what is cognition. Um, so it, it involves a lot of different things, um, brain processes that are mental skills and activity. So in general thinking, but if you break down what thinking is, it's perceiving information, right? Information comes from the world outside of you and different parts of your body pick up that information like your eyes pick up. Um, your eyes are involved in vision, your ears is, are involved in hearing, all kinds of things. Um, and then once your brain picks up those signals, it's making sense out of those signals. What am I seeing? What am I hearing? Um, and then making meaning out of it. Okay, what does it mean for me? What I'm, um, all these um, pieces of information. Um, and the meaning making part is where the rest of it comes in too, the learning and memory. So whatever you're perceiving right now, how does it fit in with what you already know of the world or of yourself or other people? Um, language and communication, how do you talk about it? How do you express what you see or feel or hear? Um, language also works the other way, right? How do you understand what other people are saying, both verbally and non-verbally? Concept formation, if you think about the concepts of things, abstract thinking, solving problems and planning. So if you have to perform a task, you have to figure out what the problem is, 
what are the steps that need to be completed to, to solve to do this task, break it down, decide which one comes first. If there's a monkey wrench in the problem um, in the situation, you have to figure out how to switch gears. And, and so there's a lot that goes into it. Um, so there's different kinds of um, cognitive changes that can happen in HD. Um, so um, early on in the disease, the cognitive decline can manifest as memory and learning difficulties, um, problems with judgment or, um, and uh, trouble with driving, um, answering questions or making decisions. And as the disease progresses, there may be more difficulties with concentration and focus and things might become more difficult. So let's talk about memory first. So if you break down memory, what does memory mean? First, you have to learn something new, right? It has to get inside your, your brain and then you have to hold on to it, the storage part. So you have to keep that, that new information in your brain over a period of time. Short-term memory in, as a neuropsychological neuropsycho um, term usually means about a few seconds time. What did you just hear someone say a moment ago. Um, long-term memory is, is um, well, we use that term in our everyday speak to talk about long-term memory, like who was my third grade teacher or what street did I grow up on? But when a neuropsychologist uses the, the term long-term memory, we're talking about um, a, a few minutes, like 20 minutes to an hour or something like that. So, um, so memory is learning something, getting it in, storing it, keeping it over a period of time, and pulling it out when you need it, right? That's the memory part. What were you supposed to do today? You have to pull that information out from what you learned yesterday. Yesterday, your mom told you to pick up some butter at the store, right? Um, and then there's another part of memory that we don't think about as much, but it's called recognition, right? So were you supposed to get butter or milk? Recognizing which one of the two things. Um, perception, we talked about that that already in some uh, some detail, but when we talk about everyday um, living perception involves your depth perception, right? Can you perceive how far down you have to step in order to go down the stairs? Can you see where the curb ends and where the street begins? Can you see or can you have a sense of where the end of your car is so you know how far to pull up before you're going to hit that pole in front of you? Um, visual identification, being able to see something and know what it is. Is that a hammock? Or is that a net, right? They have very similar properties and being able to understand what the purpose of those things are. Um, executive functioning is a very fancy term that invo involves a lot of different things, but it involves um, sort of the complex parts of thinking where you have to um, make plans and anticipate consequences. If you think about what's involved when you anticipate a consequence, when you think, okay, I'm gonna go do this thing, what are the possible you know, situations that could arise. It's based on your entire wealth of knowledge as a human person having done similar things in the past to be able to estimate the likelihood, okay, if I go to this party, I know this guy's gonna be there and, you know, what's the likelihood that I'm gonna run into? It has to do with how many people might be there, what kind of a party is, all those pieces of information get consolidated into your brain in order to make a decision. Am I gonna go, am I gonna not go? Um, multitasking, right? Stirring the pot, talking on the phone at the same time, and also kind of keeping a running list of what you might need when you go to Home Depot later today, all those things. Um, language and communication, we talked about that before, the difference between um, receptive and expressive language. But one of the problems that um, often shows up fairly early on in Huntington's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders um, is word finding issues. So you know what you want to say, you know what you're trying to express, but that one word you're looking for it. What is the word I'm looking for? Oh, sympathize, right? Or it might take you a few hours before you can think of the word that you wanted to use. And sometimes that will like derail a conversation, right? If you get so stuck on trying to find that one word that you wanted to use, like, oh, spatula, that's what I was trying to say. Um, you can kind of lose your focus in your conversation. So that can, it seems like a simple thing, but it can really have a big impact on your communication. Um, so we kind of went over this already for memory and learning. Um, it's the ability to acquire new information or modify your existing knowledge. So let's say, you always thought Huntington's disease involved something, but you learned a new piece of information. So you have to kind of adjust what your thinking is um, about, you know, a particular concept based on this new information. 
Um, and it certainly it will affect your behaviors and your values and your preferences. Um, so here's an example of um, learning. So remember, somebody says to you, remember, you're going to be meeting with John on Thursday, right? So the recall or the retrieval part, let's say the next day, somebody asks you, who are you meeting with? And you have to pull out that information. It's kind of like sorting through your file system in your brain to figure out where that information is. When is that meeting supposed to be? Um, sometimes that can be difficult um, early on. There will be changes in, in the recall part of it. But sometimes um, recognition is preserved for longer. Um, so that way, um, cues can help. Are you supposed to be meeting with Chris or Pat? Oh, okay, that's right. I remember it was with Pat. Was the meeting on Thursday or Friday? That's right. It was on Thursday. And I remember that because I also have to go to my dermatologist appointment on Thursday. So um, there's different types of memory. Um, explicit versus implicit memory. So explicit memory is the stuff that you can like say out loud to another person. My name is Charlotte. I was born on July the 19th. That's a date. A fact about me is that I grew up in Huntsville, Alabama. I can just say that out loud. Um, implicit memory is a little bit different. That's often preserved um, longer when there are cognitive difficulties. So those are skill type memories. So learning how to tie your shoelaces. It's a little bit more difficult to verbalize. You don't say to tie your shoelaces, to, you do this. You'd have to explain it in a very long way, right? Or muscle memory. Some people call it that muscle memory isn't really memory within your muscles, but it has to do with procedures that you remember how to do and you kind of do automatically. Like driving, right? If you remember when you learned how to drive, somebody explained it to you pretty explicitly. Put your foot on the brake, you know, and then take the... Um, the gear shift and put it into drive, all of that. But after you learn those basics, you just kind of do it without thinking. That's also memory too. It's just a little um, more implicit. So um, this all involves combining lots of pieces of information. So perceptual skills, I talked um, briefly earlier about um, some of the basics in terms of perceiving like visual differences. Where does the curb end? Where does the street start? But it also has to do with more subtle things like your sense of time, right? We all have a sense of how much time has passed. Even if you have, if you don't look at your watch or your, um, or your phone, you can kind of tell it's, it's been about five minutes or it's been about an hour or so. Sometimes that can be impaired. So people will sometimes say, you know, I've, I've lost my sense of time. Like I can't tell whether something happened yesterday or did it happen three weeks ago? Or other people will notice that in, in their patient who has, has Huntington's disease. Um, that may also contribute to why somebody is always running late. So think about the early disease process and how that might affect your work if you're co constantly um, arriving at work late and you really don't know why because your routine in the morning hasn't changed, nothing else is different. It might be that that sense of time um, that used to be uh, what told you, okay, you need to hurry up now, this is taking too long, you're going to be late is kind of impaired. Um, also, um, sense of personal space, that might also be one that, that changes. So different cultures have different sort of, sort of social norms, norms about what the appropriate amount of space to have between you and a person you're talking to. And of course, that changes depending on your relationship with them, right? Like you wouldn't necessarily walk right up to your boss and put your arm around their shoulder. I mean, you might if you worked with them for a very long time, but, um, but you know, you have different sense of, of what's comfortable and what's uncomfortable, right? There, I think there was a um, Saturday Night Live special about the close talker a long time ago. So somebody who's like right up in your face. And um, so sometimes that part can be kind of impaired. Um, the awareness of social no norms, like picking up on other people's bodily um, postures that tells you this person's uncomfortable, I might need to back up a little bit. So some of those things might be impaired too. Um, and also um, the ability to judge the distance between your own body and where something else is, like the corner of a, of a coffee table. So that might lead to um, bumping into things. In your own house, you don't necessarily, like a, an environment where you're real familiar with it, you don't necessarily need to see the corner of the coffee table to know that it's there and kind of go around it so you don't bump into it because you have that sense already. Um, sometimes that can be impaired as well. Um, Smell identification, um, I think that was left over from a different slide from before that's often more uh, an issue with Parkinson's disease than it is with um, Huntington's. 
Um, but in terms of emotion recognition, this may also be an issue. So being able to perceive other people's facial expressions, there is such a thing as called a micro expression, which is a, um, a very quick shift in somebody's facial expression that lasts like a split second and often, um, you know, kind of sets the tone for whatever interaction you're about to have. If you've ever had a, uh, an argument with a loved one, um, you know, you have experienced this before where you know you saw something on their face and you know something's going to happen, even though there's no actual obvious, you know, reason why you're about to get into a fight, but you know that's going to happen, right? A lot of that is based on micro expression, um, facial expressions. Um, so that you can understand how that might have an impact on your social relationships if you're having a difficulty picking up on some of those social cues. Okay, so back to um, executive functioning. So these are functions that are, um, for the most part, managed by the frontal lobes. Those are the lobes of your brain that are most um, developed in terms of evolution. They're in the front part of your brain, which is why they're called the frontal lobes. Um, and they manage a lot of different things. So um, processing speed. So how quickly you can take in new information, decide what to do about it, and then execute some sort of behavior. Um, how quickly that happens. So sometimes um, in Huntington's disease, that can be either slower, processing speed can become slower, or it's early on in the process. It may not be slower, but it takes more effort. You get more worn out just to do the same thing, just to balance your checkbook. You notice that you're, it just it becomes more of a pain in the butt than it used to be for no particular reason at all. So some people will say, oh, my math skills are down. I, you know, I can't do math anymore. It's not may not necessarily be math per se, because you still know what seven plus three is, but it might take more effort to do multiple calculations over and over like you do if if you balance your checkbook, if anybody does that anymore, um, I just use online banking and go buy it. <laughs> but because um, it's a pain in the butt. Um, but um, in terms of attention, so a lot of people think about attention as like really kind of focusing in on one thing and listening and paying attention. But there's many pieces of attention that we do all the time, shifting shifting your attention back and forth. So as I'm talking to you and leaning on the lectern, I noticed that my ID badge was poking into my stomach, so I quickly adjusted it, and I'm now back to talking to you. So being able to shift your attention from one thing to another or pay attention to two things at a time. Um, I'm a new mom, so I certainly have learned to pay attention to, you know, the timer over here and the kid over here and my husband talking to me in the back over here and trying to, you know, keep track of a million things at once. So those are all very complicated processes that sometimes can break down. So I'm going to have to speak about recommendations here in a minute, too. Um, uh, so organization, so sorting through different pieces of information and deciding this is important, this I don't really need to worry about. Your brain does that unconsciously all day long. There's no way to actually keep and retain every single piece of information that you perceive. Your brain naturally just sort of gets rid of the irrelevant stuff. Um, sometimes when there are difficulties with, um, with, or, uh, with um, executive functioning, your brain might get rid of more important stuff accidentally. So what may look like a problem with memory may actually be a problem with um, organization of information, that it's not as efficient. Um, strategizing and prioritizing. I have exactly three hours and five errands to run. Which, which ones am I going to do? Obviously, I'm going to do the ones that are all kind of grouped together, or I'm going to do the one errand that's way far away, but it's the most important one, strategizing and prioritizing. So those are all things that your frontal lobes help you do. Troubleshooting, what went wrong? What do I need to do about it? Do I need to dress it right now? Do I need to leave it for a little bit and come back to it? So those kinds of things. Um, we talked about um, language and communication. So that means both getting information in, so being able to understand what other people say, um, what you read, what you hear, those are all um, receptive language functioning functions, um, being able to process it and understand it. Sometimes I hear a lot of um, patients talking about, you know, I don't have a problem understanding, but when there's a lot of information coming to me at once or very fast, then I just kind of zone out and I don't hear any of it. So um, that, that could be an issue with language or it could be an issue with attention or it could be an issue with anxiety. We'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Um, 
getting information out. So we talked about word finding difficulty, but sometimes there's also breakdowns in syntax, meaning that the words are correct. Um, you get your meaning across, but the way that the words are arranged in the sentence isn't the normal way that we do it in the English language. So there might be word reversals, oops, word reversals where you might say a word before the other one, and you can still kind of get your meaning across so that it becomes jumbled. So if you think about if you are still working and um, you're sending an email and your words come across incorrectly and it's there in print for somebody to see, they, um, then it might be picked up on a, in terms of your uh, your job performance. So, um, so communication is basically the transfer of information from one person to the other, and it's a complex process that integrates not only your thoughts but also your muscle control. So that's where the motor part does also affect communication. It means literally the muscles of your mouth, your tongue, and your diaphragm to control your breath in order to produce the words. So you can notice I'm a little bit breathless. I usually am because I'm nervous. I don't, I'm not great at giving presentations, but um, you have to have good, excellent breath control in order to say that what you want to say. Um, and so oftentimes in patients with Huntington's disease, if there's a motor problem with the diaphragm, it does affect their ability to communicate because they might run out of air or need to breathe a little bit more quickly, which makes um, talking more effortful. So there's a lot that can be going on. So let's get to the recommendations part. Um, so if you or your loved one are having difficulties with memory, um, there's some things that you can do to try to work around it. Um, one is if you're communicating with somebody who has memory issues, try to use simple and short statements. Um, that's best for new information. You might even pause after you give a piece of information. Okay, when you go um, over to grandma's house today, Vicki's gonna be there. Pause. When you see Vicki, don't forget to ask her for X, Y, and Z. Um, you can use notes, obviously. You can keep a notebook on, on you at times. Um, if you are savvy with your phone, you could use a voice recording if you like that. Um, and repetition and practice are very old school, but very good ways to try to remember something new. You say it to yourself over and over again. Don't forget to pick up butter. Don't forget to pick up butter. Um, and you can say it out loud. It doesn't mean you have to say it loudly, but say it out loud, actually make the words with your mouth. Just the act of doing that will help it stick in your memory um, a little bit better. Um, if you find that there are certain things that are constantly being forgotten, like locking the door, you can put a sticky note right there. Um, lock the door. You might want to change it up after a while because if we see the same thing over and over again, it becomes part of like the background. You don't notice it anymore. So you want to change up the color of the sticky note or the kind of marker that you use every once in a while. Um, in case you've ever had the experience of something being there, you don't see it just because it's been there for so long. You're completely blind to it. Um, so, um, yeah, you could also, when you say things out loud and you're trying to commit them to memory, try and associate it with something else. So incorporate it um, into information that you already have. So you're gonna say it out loud. I have an appointment with John on Thursday. It's on Thursday because I'll already be at rush for my dermatology appointment and we can go and meet John right afterwards. So just the act of trying to incorporate that new piece of information with the old um, is one of the, one good way to be able to um, to be able to remember some things. Um, in terms of executive functioning, um, asking open-ended versus closed-ended questions can often get you different kinds of information. What happened yesterday, when really what you wanna know is, did you see John yesterday? Just ask, did you see John yesterday? You're probably gonna get a better answer with somebody who's having difficulty with executive functioning. Um, avoiding multitasking, concentrating on one thing at a time, um, removing distractions when necessary. So turning off the television, quieting the dog down. Okay, now remember this, I'm gonna tell you this. Um, or if you have to concentrate on doing a task, trying to remove those distractions. Um, keeping a checklist is often a great way to be able to keep track of the steps that you've completed and where you left off if you have to stop in the middle. 
um, allowing extra time for your responses, um, giving somebody verbal cues, getting them started. Obviously, you want to give somebody who has difficulty with communication a couple extra seconds to say it if they can, but they're clearly having trouble. You can say, you know, are you trying to tell me about what happened yesterday to kind of get them started can be helpful. Um, these are things that you have to kind of negotiate with your conversation partner to not overstep your bounds and put words into other people's mouth. Um, and ask for clarification. If you understand what somebody with HD is saying, ask them to repeat it. Don't pretend that you do understand because you might get an important detail um, wrong and um, that would not be good. Um, so, um, I'm going to skip over a couple of slides because I'm running out of time. Um, but um, how do we determine if there are cognitive deficits? That's when you have a neuropsychological evaluation, um, which involves an interview, some paper and pencil tests, and then oftentimes I can provide um, feedback and recommendations um, the next time you come in for your clinic visit, or if we need to do it over the phone, we can do that. Um, it usually takes about one and a half to two hours in our clinic. There are different kinds of neuropsych evaluations. Some of them take a really long time. Um, we don't have to do that, um, all of that, all the time. Um, and it um, should be done by a neuropsychologist. And um, it happens in our clinic all the time. So if you wanted to schedule one, you are welcome to do so. That is all I have to say. Questions? Thank you. I'll be available at the panel afterwards. All right. So I hope you're getting some useful information. There may be just a little bit of overlap in my slides, so I'll tell you. Uh, we just got a whole bunch of good recommendations from Dr. Anderson. So I'm Deborah Hall, I'm a movement disorder neurologist. I've met many of you, and you've noticed that frequently Krista, our physician assistant, and I are powwowing at the end of your visit, talking about what just happened as far as what did you discuss and what should we do. And so this is kind of a brief 20 minute introduction of what we're thinking about when we're thinking about how to treat a particular problem. So here's an outline of a few of the things I'm gonna talk about today. I really can't go through every medicine in great detail in 20 minutes, uh, but hopefully you can take the PowerPoint home with you and you can always bring it to the clinic if you have questions about a particular medicine or a particular symptom. We could talk about it again during the visit if you think it pertains to you. So we're just gonna quickly review symptoms of the disease, the goals of care in the clinic, um, symptom treatment versus disease modifying treatments, treating the various symptoms, and some things that we may pertain to some patients who are coming in. So the symptoms of Huntington's disease, you heard an introduction slide by Dr. Shannon, uh, but frequently patients will have symptoms in one of these three categories or all three of the categories. Everybody is a little bit different. Uh, there'll be problems with movement, problems in the psychiatric realm or problems in the cognitive realm. And we just heard about the cognitive realm from Dr. Anderson. So as far as movement, uh, extra movements or what we call chorea are very common in Huntington's disease. And we have some medicines that we will typically prescribe if these become problematic for patients. We also are spending a lot of time in the clinic addressing balance difficulties and falls. And of course, we're very worried when people start falling because we're afraid you're gonna have an injury. Right, so people will fall and break their hip, or they'll fall and um, hit their head. And so these sorts of things, when they start to happen, we like to try to address it during your visit. Uh, cognitive issues we just heard about, heard a little bit about memory decline, but there's some other things like personality change or a loss of insight. So sometimes the patient who has Huntington's may not recognize some of their symptoms. And so we'll frequently be interviewing the family with the patient in the clinic. And then finally, psychiatric symptoms. And some of these can be a bigger problem than even the movement issues. So we'll have problems with irritability. Patients may have anxiety. They may have problems with their mood. They may be feeling a little sad or down. Uh, sometimes patients will have what we call delusions. And I put a definition on here, kind of fixed thoughts or things that might not be true. Some patients will have hallucinations. They'll see or hear things that aren't there. 
And these types of symptoms are actually quite common in our clinic in general, not just Huntington's disease. And then suicidality, or a kind of increased risk of suicide, and we'll talk about that as well. So this slide, I think we um, like to think about the disease and how it changes over time. And so this also helps us as far as treating symptoms in the clinic. So if we look at this, I don't know if I have a pointer. So if you see here, this is kind of the general kind of course of Huntington's disease. So in the beginning over here, um, patients may be gene positive but not have any symptoms yet. And then right around here, they'll get the diagnosis based on some of the symptoms that they have. So chorea or the extra movements, they may have motor problems or mild cognitive problems. And then there's kind of, they will kind of progress through the stages. And then their symptoms will progress as well. And not every patient is the same in the clinic. Everybody looks a little different. And so what we're addressing in one visit might look very different when we're seeing a patient 20 minutes later. And so everyone is a little different. And at the same time, as these things are happening, we see changes in the brain. So, so the goals of care, we really want to improve quality of life. We really want folks to be able to do those things that they like to do for as long as possible. And when we're talking to folks in the clinic, it could be a realm of different things. Someone may have a hobby they want to continue doing, so we'll be trying to sort out if we can provide a medication or therapy to allow pe people to do the hobby. Uh, we obviously want to keep people as independent as possible for as long as possible. We want to make sure that people are safe. So again, protect people from falling or injuring themselves. We want to keep patients at home as long as possible for that patient and for, you know, for their family. And also, we would like to slow the disease down, although that's not quite possible. We're hoping it's coming. So as far as symptom control versus disease-modifying treatments, I just added this slide uh, because there are kind of two ways that I like to think about neurological disease. We can try to treat symptoms. So if you come in and you have problems with your balance, we can try to treat that symptom. But really what we'd like to do ultimately is slow the disease down or stop the disease. And a lot of times we don't use the term cure in brain disease because we don't really have good examples of full cures at this point. But if we could modify what happens in the disease, I think that is the ultimate goal. And so Dr. Shannon started with a very nice talk about all the things that are happening in the research world to modify the course of disease. But until we have those therapies and everybody's able to get them, we're going to keep trying to treat symptoms. So this particular 20 minutes is really talking about treating the symptoms. Now, we also heard a lot about research uh, that's ongoing. And I've got a couple little graphs down here. So DMT stands for disease modifying therapy. Really, if we have something to slow the disease down, we're probably going to want to give it earlier in the disease rather than later. We really want to get it all the way back here before people even have symptoms. So I think hopefully, hopefully in the future, we will have something we can give right here. And we don't necessarily have to be worrying about all these symptoms in the clinic. I think Dr. Shannon gave us some hope that we're heading that way. So the first symptom I'd like to address is chorea. And this is kind of some of the things that we do if we see a patient in the clinic. So if a patient comes in and they have chorea and it's on the milder side, a lot of times we will pull a milder medicine, amantadine, to treat the chorea. And actually, when I came in back into the Huntington's clinic, many of the patients were already on amantadine. I think this was a medication Dr. Shannon would use as well. And uh, what will happen, though, is sometimes it's not quite strong enough to treat the chorea and people are still having symptoms. So then we'll kind of move to a mo more moderate or stronger medicine. And these medicines are now FDA approved and they're called BMAT2 inhibitors. So tetrabenazine was the first to be approved. And uh, that particular medication, because it was first on the market, we had a little bit of experience giving it, but had some side effects. And so there's now a second uh, option and that's dutetrabenazine. So both of these medications are kind of specialty medications, and any of you who are on these medications know there is a little paperwork to fill out. Um, and what will happen is that we'll typically start on a low dose and work our way up over time. So some patients will require a higher dose of these medications because their chorea might be a little bit more severe, whereas other patients have milder symptoms and we can really keep it at a lower dose. Now, as far as patients who may have other symptoms, so say we have a patient who's got hallucinations plus they have chorea, we might choose a different medication. We may instead choose a medicine that's blocking dopamine. So these medications, uh, a lot of times they're called neuroleptics or antipsychotics. 
would include a different range of medicines. And these are some of the ones that we'll use in the clinic. Risperidone, aripiprazole, haloperidol, olanzapine. For some of you on haloperidol who may be on it for a long time, you may know we had a little bit of a shortage or a problem getting it earlier this year. Um, I think that's been resolved. Uh, but these are medications that have been around for quite some time. Now, tetrabenazine, this is a little picture on the left. It's, I don't expect anyone to be able to read that. Uh, but just in understanding how these medications work, uh, you can see that this is kind of the end of a nerve here. And it's talking to the next one over here. And what you can see is that there's these tiny little vesicles in the nerve. And these vesicles store dopamine. And the hope in, in the normal situation, you have the vesicles, you store the dopamine. The dopamine is released here, and we think that the dopamine is part of the problem in Korea. You got a lot of dopamine circulating in the brain, it's creating extra movement. And because of that, uh, the hope is that these medications, the VMAT2 inhibitors, will prevent this from occurring. So instead of all of this dopamine release, you actually have less dopamine release and subsequently less Korea. So this type of medication really has not been around that long. So we're very fortunate we have this option to treat Korea. And um, you can see here our FDA approval was very exciting when this happened. And the compounds are chemically um, similar. Now, some of the times patients will say, well, why am I on a different medication than the other person I talked to in the support group last week? And how do you make a decision about what to give? And I just have an example chart here of all the things that we think about. So when Krista and I are in the room, having a conversation during your visit, we're in our head thinking of all these things. So what is there besides the Korea that we need to think about when we choose a medication? So we may, if there's no other symptoms, we may go right to those medications I talked about. If you're somebody who's lost some weight, which is very common in Huntington's disease, we may choose a medicine that causes weight gain to kind of help that situation. If you have anxiety, we may think about a medicine called a benzodiazepine, something like clonazepam or lorazepam. Um, medicines that end at PAM a lot of times are benzodiazepines. Uh, if you have problems with apathy, we might choose a medicine that might stimulate you. Apathy, just kind of losing your motivation. So we're kind of thinking this in the clinic. Now, all the way down here, I've got no response to medication therapy and deep brain stimulation with a question mark. We're not prescribing this in the clinic yet, but there are some studies that are ongoing. We already heard about this morning. that This may be an option in the future. So if you have a combination of symptoms that are on this grid, uh, these are the medications we would be thinking about in the clinic and we would discuss with you during your appointment. So I just have inserted a couple slides about some research opportunities that are going on here at Rush. So this is a study that's going to be starting up and enrolling probably at the end of the year. This is a, another medication that's a VMAT2 inhibitor called valbenazine. It's already on the market for a disorder called tardive dyskinesia and has a little bit different side effect profile, it appears. But essentially, we'll be recruiting patients who have a repeat size, your CAG repeat size of 37 or greater. And this, site, this study is being done at about 50 sites across the country, lots of sites. So it's going to be kind of a fast study. So if you think you might be interested, you'll sign up out um, in the hallway. It's about eight visits over four months. So what about the other motor problems we're talking about in the clinic? So I already mentioned falls. A lot of times, in addition to thinking about amantadine, a second medicine is called rilazole that sometimes we'll prescribe for patients who have balance problems. We also use physical therapy a lot. We use it a lot in the movement disorder clinic because sometimes the medications aren't as good for balance as we would like them to be. And physical therapy can be really helpful because they kind of can train us how to walk safely and how to prevent falls. And so sometimes folks don't love going to physical therapy. So I have to be honest, many patients don't like it. And sometimes we'll have to recommend it a few times. Uh, but we will continue to bring it up because we have seen it be very effective for many patients. Occasionally, patients will fall frequently. They can't remember what the therapist said. So we would recommend a wheelchair. And we actually uh, have a wheelchair clinic here at Rush that we can send folks to if we think we need something special. Many patients with Huntington's will develop problems with their speech or their swallowing. So we'll also refer to speech therapy. Sometimes patients will need one visit, sometimes they'll need many visits, and sometimes we have to use some creativity so that we can communicate with folks if they're very hard to understand. So something like a word board can be used in Huntington's disease where you have kind of a sheet or a board with different things on them that you can signal, I'm in pain, or I need something, I need to go to the restroom. Um, so those sorts of things can be 
kind of that brainstormed with the speech therapist if you've got problems communicating with your family member. Choking, some of our patients will have choking when they swallow, and so we'll ask them to eat slowly. Uh, sometimes do some education with the speech therapist. We can change the, the way people eat or the type of consistency of food. Uh, and occasionally patients, uh, especially in later stages, may we may have a discussion in the clinic about tube feedings. So cognitive symptoms in Huntington's. So probably in this first box here, uh, you already heard some strategies from Dr. Anderson before me. There is a medication that has some data on it called rivastigmine. It's a medication that was really developed in Alzheimer's disease, but we use in Parkinson's disease and other diseases in the clinic with memory problems. It may have some benefit, although I think, again, the data probably needs to, we need more, we need more studies on these compounds in Huntington's. Impulsivity can be very common, and these can lead to injuries because people, when they're impulsive, will get up and start moving quickly, and we'll see this even in the clinic. Uh, so there are a few things that we can do. I think some of these strategies we've heard about already, having predictable daily schedules. Um, the caregiver, the calmer the caregiver is, the more helpful that can be in someone who's real impulsive. It can be challenging, though, um, if you're a caregiver. And then medications. We do have some medications that can be helpful. As far as irritability, irritability can range from no irritability to this is the number one symptom that we hear about tend to talk about this a lot. Sometimes we need to give medications for this, but again, there are some strategies that we can think about. So walking through patients, walking people through what's going to happen. So I think Dr. Anderson already said, you know, telling people what's going to happen for the day, what is the schedule, or writing it down can be helpful. Learn the signals. So you want to be able to read your family member who has Huntington's and know that they're starting to get a little irritated or agitated and being able to take those steps to kind of calm things down a little bit. You may want to redirect or kind of shift their attention to something different if there's a particular topic that's making them irritable. And acknowledging it is always a good idea. There are several medications we will use for irritability. You're going to see serotonin medications come up a lot in these slides. Probably all of us need a little bit more serotonin, especially going into the winter. We're in the Midwest, so probably Prozac in the water would be helpful for everybody. Um, that in our light therapy box that I like to talk about as we lose the sun for six months. Um, but essentially, serotonin medicines can be very helpful in Huntington's. Now, one of the problems we have in Huntington's disease that's not, we don't see that often in other diseases, is this kind of lack of insight. So the patient with Huntington's may not recognize their symptoms. I think this can be very frustrating for caregivers or family members because they, it's, it can be very apparent to them, but less apparent to the person who has the disease. So, you know, recognizing that this is part of the disease and it's not really a choice of the patient who has it can be really helpful, um, but there may be some strategies that you can use. So the things that, um, if you're a caregiver of someone with Huntington's, recognizing that having the patient know or have insight is not necessarily the goal, because the brain's not going to necessarily allow that. And so the goals are going to have to be a little bit different. And sometimes counseling or working with the neuropsychologist, working with your provider can be helpful. Um, you might want to have goals that are behavioral goals that are very specific rather than goals of understanding the disease. So for example, our goal today is to go to physical therapy. Threw that back in there just to keep encouraging physical therapy. Um, so I think sometimes some, just knowing if you're a family member or caregiver, just knowing that it's not a conscious choice of the patient can be really helpful. But you wanna just remind yourself if you feel like you're struggling with this issue. And we'll remind folks in the clinic as well. We heard a little bit about executive function. I think some of these things were already talked about uh, by Dr. Anderson. Psychiatric symptoms are very common. They're very common in our clinic in general, whether it's Huntington's or any of the other diseases we see. Probably half of our patients have depression or anxiety or both. Uh, so the serotonin medicines are coming back here. Fluoxetine is a favorite of ours, the Prozac, um, and many of the other ones in this category also work on serotonin. They have a little bit different side effect profile, so we might choose one over another. Many of them are generic, so that also helps. Um, now, some of the medicines are not purely serotonin. They work on some of the other transmitters in the brain. And we might choose one of those if the serotonin medicine causes some side effects. And so we'll frequently be having those conversations with you in the clinic. Anxiety, 
come back to the serotonin medicines and those benzodiazepines, and they can be used in combination. So depending on what, how severe the anxiety is, we may prescribe one or two medicines for it. And then finally, the psychotic symptoms, the hallucinations, the delusions, we have a whole host of things that we can use. And again, we'll choose those depending on what else is going on, if there's career or not. There are many other behavioral symptoms that we may see in Huntington's disease. Many patients will have obsessive compulsive behaviors, and so they'll have kind of thoughts or behaviors that they do over and over again. Um, so sometimes these need to be treated, so we'll pull med medicines off the shelf. We can use some of the strategies Dr. Anderson was talking about, about redirecting um, or trying to change the focus of attention. You don't necessarily want to confront somebody and tell them that what they're you're not actually seeing anything. That doesn't necessarily help the person who's seeing something that's not there. So you want to probably develop some strategies, talk to your health provider, or talk to the neuropsychologist about other things that you can do. Some patients with Huntington's will have kind of a really elevated mood, almost a manic. If you've ever heard about bipolar disease or mania, sometimes some of those um, symptoms can uh, come up or pop up in Huntington's disease where patients are um, kind of overactive. They're kind of hyper. They seem to be hyper, they seem to be very elevated mood, very happy, they don't sleep, um, very impulsive. That's above and beyond what they would normally uh, would be on a day-to-day -day basis. So in that case, we're actually gonna pull some medicines that are a little different. And those medications, we wouldn't necessarily use um, in a standard way in Huntington's, but we will choose one of those if there's some mania present. And then finally, aggressive behaviors. These can occur in the disease. They can be a little bit unpredictable uh, but having plans of how you're going to manage that, um, talking through a plan, uh, our social worker can be very helpful. We'll hear from Sam later this morning. Uh, and trying to avoid triggers if you know that there's something that calls people or causes people to be agitated. You want to make sure you call for help. You can always call our clinic. Again, Sam or I or Krista, someone will call you back and we'll, we'll problem solve with you. We can also pres prescribe medicines. We call them PRN medicines as needed. If patients will get, um, there are times where people are aggressive, we need to calm that down medically, we can do that as well. I just want to bring up suicide. This does uh, happen in Huntington's disease, and it's a little bit higher than in the general population. So I just want to remind people that we will ask about this in the clinic. So if you're wondering why we ask all the time, this is exactly why. And of course, we want, we want to make sure everybody is safe. And so many patients who um, are feeling like they want to hurt themselves, have depression. They may or may not be on treatment for it, but we definitely want to address it if it's present. Sometimes we'll ask people to come into the hospital so we can get you on the right medicine combination before sending you home. A lot of times we'll use serotonin medicines to treat the mood. You want to make sure that if this is going on, if, if you're, you're, you're a patient and you've thought about it, or if it's come up in conversation and you're a caregiver, you want to bring it up at your visit or call us, especially if it's urgent, call us right away. We always want to think about removing the firearms from the home, so you hear us ask about that in the clinic. And we may ask you to establish care with the psychiatrist if we think we're going to have some challenges in treating it. Sleep disorders. I think everybody has problems with sleep, whether you have Huntington's or not. It's very, very common. Uh, but this can occur. I see some people saying no, so maybe we can take some tips um, from you. Uh, but essentially, insomnia can be quite common in Huntington's disease, and it's from a whole host of different reasons. Sometimes the movements are a problem, so if you kind of are in waking up from sleep and you're moving, it might prevent you from going back to sleep. Uh, sometimes patients are with Huntington's who aren't active, aren't working during the day, aren't getting out of the home. They have less stimulation. They may find it hard for the brain to go to sleep at night because it's not very tired. If there are mood or anxiety disorders or other issues with the sleep cycle, uh, that can all be problematic. Sometimes the sleep cycle reverses and people think the day is night and the night is day and that makes it very hard to try to sleep. So there are some tips that we use across all of our diseases. We try to keep people awake during the day. A lot of times we'll have people consider activities or day programs they can go to to kind of keep you awake. Uh, we treat, if there's a mood disorder, we treat it because that can impact sleep. We encourage exercise during the day, again, to wake you up. And then we have several medicines that we can use. So I, I have one slide in here on juvenile Huntington's disease. This is when the disease starts earlier than the age of 20. Patients with juvenile Huntington's disease may have a different set of symptoms than patients who develop it later in life. They tend to have um, a little bit less chorea, maybe no chorea at all. 
They tend to be kind of stiff or rigid. And the behavioral changes may come before the movement problems. And so we may have a different strategy of treating somebody who has juvenile Huntington's than somebody who's an adult with Huntington's disease. And uh, we may initiate therapies right away because of the stiffness or rigidity, the problems with walking. Um, we may also, again, use speech therapy. And the types of medicines we use, although they may be very similar, we may use them in a different order in this patient population. Family counseling can be really helpful because, again, you have somebody who's on the younger side, and the counseling can also be helpful for other children in the family. So I just wanted to remind everybody that HDSA, the Huntington Society, has this National Youth Alliance, which I think is a really good youth source for youth who are um, involved with Huntington's disease. So there are a few things. This is my later stage slide. There are some things that we consider that might be different if people are in later stages. Some patients will um, aspirate food into their lungs and develop a pneumonia. So we'll be having the primary care provider help us treat those. Sometimes patients later stage will scream a little bit. And you know, a lot of times when that happens, we need to be thinking about pain or mood and be treating that even if people can't communicate with us very well. Sometimes patients don't want to eat. So we want to think about that. Uh, we already talked about wheelchair. Uh, occasionally patients will have a lot of extra movement or be very impulsive and we'll have to think about things like restraints. Um, some patients, because they're impulsive, we have to think about, we use a lot of chair alarms or bed alarms so that the caregiver knows as soon as the patient's up and moving, the alarm goes off and they can even connect it to your phone. So your phone will buzz and say, person's up. And then you know immediately to go look for them. I've starred the sexually inappropriate behavior and substance abuse because that can happen anytime in the disease. So if those things happen, please talk to us. Uh, there's probably nothing we haven't heard. And so we'd be happy to help kind of problem solve with you. Just another uh, study slide enrolled. Probably every person, hopefully, has heard about this study coming through the clinic. This is an observational study. It's a worldwide study. Over 20,000 people now, I believe, are enrolled. And this particular study is a once a year visit. It's what we call observational, so we're kind of observing how things change over time. And you can enroll if you're gene negative and in a Huntington's family, or of course if you're positive at any stage. Uh, enroll is moving more towards enrolling people who are earlier in the stages of Huntington's disease, but it's really a, a mechanism we can use to pull people into clinical trials if clinical trials become available. There's a new study starting that's kind of similar to enroll. It's called later stage HD assessments. And this is starting after the first of the year, again, probably all over the world. And this is specifically for patients in later stages, and it's less for them to do. So the visits are shorter, and there's less things to fill out and other things. So it should be easier uh, for patients who are later in the disease. So this is really a review. Dr. Shannon went into this in great detail. Um, just as an intro to this, one more study I want to mention. So the Huntington protein, this is my, so I kind of feel like I'm going back to basic biology, but this really helps me to make it very simple. You know, the DNA gets turned into RNA, which turns into protein. So that's about as simple as I can make it. But for me, I think it's really helpful to think about it that way. That's actually what the Huntington protein looks like in a 3D form. It's 2D here, but you can imagine it in 3D. And this particular protein is in all the cells. It's in humans and mammals, but it's really highest in the brain and in the testes. And you can see it in other organs. Um, but essentially what happens, as Dr. Shannon said, the abnormal protein builds up in the cell, and that causes the cells to become sick. These are the little aggregates. You can see this very complicated picture. It's not the only thing that happens in the cell, um, but that's one of the main problems. So Dr. Shannon already mentioned the study, Unicure. So we are a site for the study. There are six sites across the country. We'll be starting in 2020. They're going to take 26 patients total across the country, and there's three surgical sites. And so this was the gene therapy study. It has the potential to last for quite a while. And what's going to happen is that here's the gene, here's the message. Essentially, we're going to stick something to the message so the protein essentially dissolves. Okay, so the protein dissolves. And as Dr. Shannon said, um, this is an early phase study, so it's a phase 1-2 study. And um, to qualify, you have to have a repeat size of 44 or larger, and that's because they think that that's in the um, animal studies. It looks like you need that repeat size at least for gene silencing. So that's coming. So if anyone's interested, 
The study hasn't started yet, but we can take your name in the hallway at the research table. So I think I'm out of time, but we're at a break. So if anybody has a quick question, we could probably answer it now. Yes. Okay, so the question is about CRISPR. Dr. Shannon already mentioned CRISPR. Do you want to comment on that? On the European CRISPR studies and where they are? Right, so all the CRISPR studies are in preclinical animal models, no human CRISPR studies yet. There are lots of reasons to be afraid of CRISPR. If it pr proceed very cautiously because um, it can edit genes that you aren't interested in editing. And the extent of that is not completely known. It was thought to be a rare thing, but in a recent study looked farther away from the editing site and found lots of changes in other genes. So you may be causing genetic diseases, which is the one you're trying to cure. So a lot of preclinical work needs to be done before it can be done. In animal. And because it's permanent, any bad gene edits are there forever. So. Yes, thank you. My question involves early onset versus later onset of symptoms in patients that um, are positive for HD. And as far as the research, um, eradication versus trying to slow the process of the disease, are we looking at why some patients develop the disease later? And is there something in the proteins there that would help understand or yes absolutely do you want to take that dr shannon another research question so i think uh, the question is are they doing research trying to sort out early stage versus not early stage early onset versus later onset and do we know why some people develop oh. it earlier and some people develop it oh, later? oh yes that's really interesting so the the uh, venezuela population because there are so many people and they're all descended from the same ancestors is a very good place to study um, the genetics and and your um, research genetics is able to try to sort out how much how powerful the gene is. You know, you, you know you have to have that gene mutation to get Huntington's disease, but the question is how much does having that mutation drive the process? And could other things also be driving the process? For example, other genes that you might have that could make it worse, or environmental exposure, smoking, drinking, whatever. Uh, that could be either. So there's a way to calculate the power of the gene versus the power of the environment. And basically the gene, the mutation size, drives about 50% of the disease process. And the other 50% comes from other genes you might have and um, environmental exposures. And one of the big, one of the big goals of the enroll is to try to figure out what those things are. So in real life, and this is true, I mean, if you have a f large family, you'll know that two people with the same repeat size, someone might have gotten sick much earlier than someone else. Or, um, so, um, and it may be, let's say you have a gene that makes your cells much more able to tolerate protein clumps in them. So your cells are going to live longer, so your disease will start later. Or maybe, we don't know these ones yet, but maybe uh, drinking alcohol accelerates the disease, or maybe drinking caffeine, but we don't know what those are. So enroll... HD because it has the genetics and then it follows people along. It can track progression and look for other genes that might be helpful in, in delaying onset. And let's let give you one example. So there's one gene that's been discovered where if you have a certain version of that gene, a certain sequence in that gene, your disease on average starts six years later than people with the same repeat length who don't have that gene. And the reason that's important is it helps us understand those changes, but also because if you can make a medicine that does the same thing as the gene, you might be able to delay onset by six years. That's a great thing. So that's a really interesting area. So it's a great question. Um, very interesting. Because uh, you can't have Huntington's without the mutation, but you can have all different kinds of Huntington's, right? All different ages of onset and progression rates with the same, muta same size mutation. And I just want to add to that, that this is the importance of having people who aren't gene positive, because a lot of times we'll look at people who don't have Huntington's at their genes and do a comparison. Right, and so that's why enroll is enrolling all sorts of individuals, because when you do genetic studies, you always want to compare people with the disease and different types of disease, and people who don't have the disease to see across the genome what the, the differences are between the two groups. So yeah.
Any other questions? Okay, yes. One more. Yeah, I was just curious about, you were talking about um, treating Korea symptoms, mm -hmm. um, but just in general and, and determining medications for any kinds of symptoms. It seems to me, I, I just don't, I'm not clear how if you're relying on the patient for a lot of the information in determining medication, and yet you say the patient sometimes has difficulty recognizing their own symptoms, mm -hmm. how you kind of manage that. Sure. So uh, many of you know when you come into the clinic, it is a team approach on both sides, right? So frequently we have a patient and a caregiver or family, and then we have a physician, a physician assistant, a social worker, a genetic counselor. So there are, are kind of teams of people. And so what we do is we kind of take it, we interview everybody. And sometimes what the patient says and what the caregiver says are two different things. Sometimes we'll actually step out in the hallway with the caregiver and have another conversation in case we've missed something. And then we put all that information together and make a decision. Now, sometimes a patient comes in without anybody with them. And we try, I mean, I'll call, say somebody lives in a, nursing facility, I'll call the nursing facility and talk to the nurses and try to find out from the nurses what's going on. So it's really trying to gather all the data and then make a decision about what are we going to treat today? What's the highest priority? So again, it's very important that we hear from the patient and that the patient tells us, but we also want to get information from everyone else and then based on that make a good decision about what we need to do next. Does that answer the question? All right, so I think it's time for the break. I just wanted to let everyone know there's a pink sheet that will arrive at your chair. This is a survey for today, and it's really important, especially on the back page, to tell us what topics you would like to hear about if we repeat the course next year, which is very likely given how many people we have here today. So please fill this out for us so we have some information, and we're going to come back in 15 minutes, in 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So grab a quick coffee and come on back. Thank you.
Okay, I think we're gonna get started. I thought that background music was kind of nice. I like we're in a movie here. Uh, all right, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker. This is Krista Cooper, physician assistant, and any of you here at Rush uh, is probably met her. Is she here? Yeah, she's right there. Okay, I couldn't see her around the thing so big. See if you stand, if I stand behind it, you wouldn't even know I was there, right? So I'm over here. Okay, uh, so she is going to talk about a hot topic. This is hot in every clinic I do. Somebody asks about marijuana or CBD. I get a lot of questions about CBD. So she's going to hopefully answer all of these questions for us and uh, field your questions at the end. So Krista. Goes forward. Forward. And this is her. Okay. All right. Hi there. Um, so I'm Krista. As Hal mentioned, I'm the physician assistant in the Rush Clinic. We do get a lot of questions about medical marijuana and CBD, so I'm going to go through um, a lot of human research that's been done specifically in Huntington's disease, and then also some laws uh, surrounding this topic. The state laws vary, and then obviously federal law uh, it does not prohibit the use of medical marijuana. So first we have to answer the question, what is medical marijuana? Marijuana contains approximately 100 different uh, compounds. Those compounds are called cannabinoids. The most uh, prevalent uh, compound that you probably have all heard of is THC. That's the main cannabinoid in marijuana. And that has the psychoactive properties. So that's what causes the high feeling when you smoke marijuana. The second most common cannabinoid is called uh, cannabidiol, or CBD for short. Um, that's the second most common. It does not have the mind-altering effect. So we don't expect people to get that high feeling. It doesn't have psychoactive properties. It comes in many different forms, uh, including leaves, pills, even sprays, creams, and liquid form. So I alluded to this uh, earlier, but the laws vary by state. You can see that the dark green states actually have medical and legal marijuana um, uh, and recreational marijuana legalized. Uh, some of the state's recreational laws haven't gone into effect yet. Uh, Illinois is one of those. Recreational marijuana isn't uh, uh, legalized yet. It will start in January 1st, 2020, so not very far away. It's important to note, though, the states that don't have either uh, medical or recreational marijuana legalized, including a couple states that share the border with Illinois. So the medical marijuana laws in Illinois, in order to get a card, you have to be a resident of the state. Uh, when you apply and also during the entire duration that you are in the medical marijuana program. Uh, Illinois actually has a list of conditions uh, that are approved for medical marijuana cards. The list was last updated in August, and unfortunately, Huntington's disease was not one of the, on the list. There were some other uh, neurological conditions that were included. You have to have a signed physician certification. You have to be at least 18 years old. Um, you cannot hold a commercial driver's license, probably for obvious reasons. We don't want people driving. Um, while uh, using medical marijuana. You also can't be an active uh, duty law enforcement officer, firefighter, or correctional officer. The laws for recreational marijuana, however, are a little bit different. So there is an age difference. You can be uh, 21 in order to buy a recreational marijuana in Illinois, and you can buy that in medical dispensaries. Uh, like I mentioned, this is not starting till January, so a few months away. It's also prohibited to smoke in any public place, in any motor vehicle, or near anyone under the age of 21. So even if you're in your household um, where you are legally allowed to use recreational marijuana, it's still against the law if there are people under 21 in the vicinity. So the FDA does actually regulate THC and CBD products. There's only three FDA approved uh, products that contain synthetic THC. And those are Marinol, Syndros, and Kesemet. 
These do require a prescription, and they're only FDA approved for very specific conditions. So not just anybody can have access or get a prescription or get approved for that, these medications. One of the conditions is the anorexia specifically associated with people that are suffering from AIDS. Another condition is chemotherapy induced nausea, nausea and vomiting. So usually you uh, would have had to try other medications for nausea and if those fail, then uh, you could get one of these medications. There's only one FDA approved medication that can tr uh, contains CBD and that's called Epidiolex. And it also requires a prescription and it's only approved for very specific types of seizure disorders. Uh, all of the THC and CBD products that you see over the counter, online, advertised, those are not regulated by the FDA. Um, and if they are claiming to have therapeutic benefits or have a very specific medical use, they're actually in violation of the law. And the FDA has started to send warning letters. I don't know how much these companies care about just a warning letter, but they, uh, some of them are getting those. What does FDA approval mean? Dr. Shannon did talk a little bit about this, but in order to get a substance or a medication approved by the FDA, it has to be evaluated to specifically what it treats. You have to figure out that it actually works, um, what the proper dosage is so people don't accidentally overdose or even underdose and they're not getting treated appropriately. Uh, very importantly, you have to figure out how it interacts with other medications. So is this going to interact with a blood pressure medication or a uh, antidepressant medication? And then you have to determine the side effects and any safety concerns. The FDA's role is really just to evaluate the research that the investigators conduct. They don't actually conduct the research themselves. I've also gotten some questions about the right to try bill. Um, the FDA is actually not involved in that, um, those decisions. The companies that are making investigational drugs can determine whether or not to allow their investigational drug um, kind of be open for people that are eligible under the Right to Try Act. So I, the last that I had heard, um, Roche or Genentech right now is not opening their medication up uh, underneath the Right to Try Act. So THC is medicine. So there actually is some evidence that THC is effective in chronic pain. I mentioned the chemotherapy-induced nausea, seizures, neuropathic pain, which is nerve-related pain. Uh, muscle spasticity, that's specifically in multiple sclerosis or MS and cerebral palsy. And then cachexia, which is a wasting disorder or a, an anorexia associated mostly with HIV AIDS. It's also likely effective, but it still needs more cl clinical trials in some eating disorders, glaucoma, insomnia, and anxiety. It's important to note, though, that first-time users of THC actually can have uh, an increase, a spike in anxiety instead of uh, a calming effect. And then I mentioned the CBD product um, has been found to be effective for seizures, but then also for anxiety. There has been animal research specifically in HD models. So there was a mouse model of HD that was treated with a one-to-one -one ratio of THC and CBD, so a combination of both. And some of the mouse uh, motor uh, symptoms, including like a paw clasping behavior that's thought to represent the dystonia in humans, um, actually improved. So that was um, uh, great for that research. But then there were some other motor symptoms that didn't improve, um, including uh, motor symptoms that are thought to represent the chorea of Huntington's disease. Um, Dr. Hall mentioned a little bit about uh, cells and how cells can um, die because of, their, because of the mutated Huntington. So cells that express mutated Huntington were exposed to CBD, and the CBD was found to, um, uh, to show a 50 to almost 80, 85 percent protection against cell death. So very encouraging. Um, hopefully that's encouraging researchers to look into this more and more. And uh, the investigators thought that it was the antioxidant mechanisms that actually helped protect those cells. 
Now let's go into human research, maybe a little bit uh, more relevant to us here in this room. So the first clinical trial I'm going to talk to you about involved just 15 people. So if you remember what Dr. Shannon said earlier today, we really need larger groups of people to uh, definitively decide if something works or not. But this is a start, so we have a start here. So 15 people with mild to moderate HD participated. They were treated with CBD for six weeks. Then they had what's called a washout period for eight weeks, meaning they didn't get CBD or placebo. So they just had eight weeks with nothing, and then six weeks of placebo. They were treated with 10 milligrams uh, per kilogram daily of oral CBD. It was di divided into twice daily, so maybe uh, like breakfast and dinner, twice daily dosing. And unfortunately, the investigators didn't find any improvement in chorea or motor scores. They didn't look at cognitive and behavioral changes, however. Um, but they also didn't have any toxic side effects, so it appeared safe. Um, so this uh, brings up an important question. Could a longer study or a study that had more people in it have produced uh, more positive results? So the second trial is itty bitty, just three people, so very small, um, but still important uh, to uh, learn from these three people's experience. They were aged between 30 and 56. They had a disease duration from about seven to 12 years. And CBD was given to these three patients orally uh, at 300 milligrams for the first week. And then they escalated the dose to 600 milligrams for three weeks after that. So it was a four week study. There was no placebo. Um, and it was found that there was some slight improvement in chorea in the first week, and then even further improvement in the next three weeks on the higher doses. The only side effect that the researchers commented on was a mildly low blood pressure. And I know typically we think low pressure, blood pressure, that's great. It is for the average person. But if it's too low, you could faint or fall. Um, so we definitely are worried about low blood pressure. Um, importantly, the laboratory tests and blood work was all normal. And then again, it's just three people, so not a, a lot of data, but still important in the grand scheme of things to look at all data that's available. So uh, there is a THC CBD compound called Sativex, and that was used to treat HD patients. It's not currently available in the United States. It's actually available in about 20 to 25 countries outside of the US, but specifically for muscle spasticity related to multiple sclerosis, MS. It contains a one-to-one -one ratio of THC and CBD. So this is what was used um, in the mouse model of Huntington's disease. So this particular trial involved 25 participants with HD. They were treated with the Sativex for 12 weeks, so a little bit longer and they uh, used 12 sprays per day. It was an intranasal spray. Um, unfortunately, they didn't see any benefits in motor, cognitive, or behavioral symptoms. So the investigators were looking at all three areas, and um, there were also not any improvements in the biomarkers um, related to Huntington's disease. So there was a placebo control. They compared the patients that got placebo to the patients that got the Sativex, and the functional outcomes were the same. So functionally, the patients did the same whether or not they got the active medication. But again, it appeared safe. So that, that is important. Although we didn't see improvements in the motor, cognitive, and behavioral, it still did appear safe that there weren't um, any severe side effects. The next um, trial I'm going to talk to you about involved a medication called Nabilone. Uh, I mentioned it earlier. Its uh, brand name is Kesemet, so it is an FDA-approved medication in the U.S., but it's only approved for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. It comes in pill form, and it's a synthetic compound, so it mimics THC. It's not actually pure THC. Um, it's just the it mimics it. It was a little bit larger of a study, which is nice, 37 patients. They were symptomatic, so this wasn't pre-symptomatic uh, patients. They were symptomatic. They were treated with the nabilone with either one or two milligrams and uh, for five weeks, and then for placebo for five weeks. And they also had that washout period in between the treatment phases. The most common side effects were, were drowsiness and forgetfulness. And again, there were no significant improvements in chorea, um, but 
uh, nobody had dropped out of the study, so none of the side effects were so severe that people had to stop taking the nabilone. Um, this is just a case report, so it's not a clinical trial. It's just one patient's experience with taking a nabilone. Um, this patient was actually outside of the United States and got it prescribed for her. So she's a 43-year-old female. She developed HD when she was 24, and she was living with her husband, but her husband was having a lot of difficulties caring for her due to some per personality changes and, and some impulsive behaviors. So she ended up having to move into a residential care facility. At that time, her, phys her physician started her on nabilone one milligram daily. And um, after being on the medication for a little while, her husband and the staff at the residential treatment uh, facility uh, reported that her behaviors got better and her chorea got better. Um, it really helped her quality of life. Um, her husband was able to take her out um, and be with her more often um, because before the behaviors were just so severe, he really wasn't able to take her out of the care facility. It's important, though, to know that no formal measurement tools were made. So we have formal documentation that the chorea actually was less. It's just her husband and the staff's kind of opinion of what they notice, which is still important. Um, but typically, uh, in research, we want things to be a little bit more standardized. So another case report, um, again, outside of the United States, a uh, patient on Nabilone. He was 58. Um, he started developing Korea just six years prior. He had a CAG repeat of 42, and he had never been on any treatments for Huntington's disease before this. He was only given a one-time dose of the Nabilone at 1.5 milligrams. So he came into clinic, he was evaluated, given a one-time dose of Nabilone, and three hours later, he was evaluated again. Um, the, his physician felt that his chorea and motor scores actually uh, worsened after the treatment, and his walking became so impaired that he needed assistance, which he didn't need assistance to walk prior to uh, receiving the Nabilone. Um, after about 24 hours, the symptoms re uh, uh, decreased, but they didn't resolve for about uh, 48 hours. So it took a little while to kind of get it out of his system and have him walking and back to his normal self. Um, they did do cognitive testing, though, and there was no cognitive difference before and after treatment. So his cognition stayed the same. He didn't have worse memory uh, or other cognitive uh, deficits after being treated with nabilone. But it was a very short study. It wasn't looking at long-term data. It was really just a one-time kind of slice-in-time picture. There's a couple case reports of HD patients using medical mar marijuana for other conditions, and they, but they had Huntington's disease. Um, so two patients were evaluated. They had been using medical marijuana. They were evaluated while they were using that substance, and then they were asked to stop um, for 48 hours, and they are evaluated again. Um, both uh, patients reported less anxiety while using the medical marijuana. But the other results were really mixed. So one patient had less depression, one had more depression when they were using medical marijuana. And then the same thing for the motor in Korea um, scores. One patient had worse Korea, one had uh, improved Korea. And, but the cognitive changes, again, the cognitive performance was uh, similar compared to using the medical marijuana and being So I know this is not a trial in Huntington's disease, but we know there are cognitive changes in Huntington's disease. So I thought I'd include it, and it might be relevant for us. Um, so there was a SATAVEX trial for patients with dementia. Um, there, it's a little bit larger, a 40-patient um, trial. They determined that it was well tolerated, so none of the participants dropped out of the study because they had severe side effects. But they looked at very specific symptoms, and all of the symptoms they looked at did not improve with using the Sativex. So that included agitation, nighttime behavioral disturbances, anxiety, mobility, falls, and mood symptoms. So uh, THC and CBD are not benign substances. They can have side effects. We're still learning some of the side effects, especially the long-term side effects. We don't have a lot of data on that yet. So a few of the side effects that have been reported for CBD use specifically 
is fatigue, diarrhea, changes in appetite, and then even uh, liver enzyme abnormalities. A few of the side effects for THC, that's the psychoactive uh, component in marijuana, include weakness, behavioral and mood changes, fatigue, again, uh, dizziness, intoxication, and then cognitive and memory changes. And then even more importantly, it's uh, good to remember, we don't know if you are using THC or CBD products, we cannot tell you how they interact with your prescription medication. So we don't know that yet. Um, so it's very important to talk to myself or Dr. Hall or your healthcare provider and let us know if you're using these products. Um, so we're at least aware if something changes in your health that that and it correlates to your starting um, medical marijuana or your starting CBD, we can eliminate that as a cause of your health change. Um, so to go a little bit more into the cognitive and memory possible side effects of THC, there were 20 MS, multiple sclerosis patients, that had been using cannabis chronically. So cannabis, that includes the THC portion of medical marijuana. And they were found to have reduced cognitive function and diminished volumes of uh, specific areas of the brain compared to MS patients that had not been using uh, cannabis. And then there was another study that found MS patients that used cannabis were twice as likely to uh, be classified as globally cognitively impaired compared to those MS patients that had not been using cannabis. So again, not totally benign substances. We don't know the long-term effects on uh, cognition and memory. And in Huntington's disease, we already know the disease itself can cause impairments in those uh, domains. And so what does this all mean to us? Why do we care? What does this mean? So the most important thing is really more research is needed. So if you remember all of the trials I talked about, they're very small, um, less than 40 people. So we really don't have a definitive answer. We need more research. Um, some of the research, though, it, it, even these small trials and case reports, it helps kind of push us in the right direction and uh, hopefully uh, has sci scientists kind of paying more attention to uh, medical marijuana and CBD use. Um, cell studies have shown that it can be neuroprotective, um, but human studies really haven't shown that yet. And uh, I would say right now, the research that we have, it, it really does not support the widespread use of every Huntington's patient or at-risk youth or pre-symptomatic patient um, using THC and CBD products. And then again, it's not risk-free. We don't really know all of the side effects and we don't know the possible drug-to-drug -drug interactions with your prescription medications. The most important thing is to talk to your healthcare provider. So whether that be Myself, Dr. Hall, your primary care doctor, talk if you're interested in using a product like this. I usually ask people, well, what are you interested in uh, using it for? Is there something specific? If you tell me I just heard it's good for Huntington's disease, I probably wouldn't recommend it at this time, but I'm always willing to have these discussions. All right, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. I think a microphone's going to come up. Did I understand that CBD has not been um, approved by the FDA? And if that's the case, how can they be selling it? That's a great question. There is one product, the Epidiolex, that's been approved by the FDA in the United States that in, uh, contains CBD. But supplements are not regulated by the FDA. So if CBD is being sold as a vitamin or supplement, it doesn't necessarily have to be regulated. So even your vitamin D supplements, your calcium supplements, those aren't necessarily regulated either. Um, and they, they usually the FDA doesn't get involved unless they're making kind of wild claims at curing things um, and making it sound like they have a specific medical use. All right. Thank you.
Okay, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Samantha Lundy. She is a social worker who works in our clinic and it's gonna talk to you a little bit about caregiver support and resources. Okay, there she is. Hi everyone, like Dr. Hall said, my name is Sam. I'm the social worker for the HD clinic here at Rush. I'm relatively new to the clinic uh, as of June, but I've been at Rush for a while. So I wanted to also talk about what social workers do in the clinic. Um, a lot of times it's people's first time working with a social worker when they see me. So I wanted to get everyone up to speed on what we can provide. Uh, today I was asked to talk about caregiver resources and support. Um, and as you've heard from many of the providers prior to me, caregivers are an integral part of the care team. And it's very important that we work with you and we support you so that way your loved ones are healthy and we can take as best care of them as we can. So I like to start off some of my presentations with breathing and grounding exercises. It helps me relax a little and I think it's great for the audience uh, to practice and you can use this later as well. Uh, so this is a four, seven, eight breathing. Um, it's very popular if you haven't heard of it, um, but We'll do two rounds together. If you have any breathing difficulties already, you don't have to participate or you can just modify it so it's most comfortable for you. But you'll breathe in for four seconds through your nose, hold for seven, and then release for eight. So we'll do this together. Breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and release. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One more time. Breathe in. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And release. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So those are just some of the techniques, and I think Dr. Anderson mentioned them some as well, but just to help um, get you into the present and kind of get your body relaxed and your mind relaxed as well. So we like to use these a lot and we can talk more about them one-on-one -on -one if you're interested. <clears throat> so there was an AARP study done. They surveyed caregivers in 2015 and they asked caregivers what they wanted to learn more about or what they wanted more support on. And so there were four main areas that caregivers wanted help with. Uh, they wanted to help make a safe home for their loved ones so that way they could age in place and not be moved to a facility. Uh, they wanted help managing personal stress because as we know, caregiving can be a lot for one person to take on. They wanted help with end of life decisions and they wanted help managing some challenging behaviors. And so Dr. Hall and Dr. Anderson talked a lot about that already. Um, caregivers uh, take on a lot in these roles and it can affect them in various areas of their lives. Um, so there's physical, emotional, and financial. And all of these stressors, strains, and pressures go up the longer you're caring for someone. So a year as compared to 10 years, the more hours you put in per week caring for someone. Um, if you have to help provide some of the nursing needs, so uh, Hygiene, eating, getting ready in the morning, transferring, um, those create a little bit more stress. Um, and then if you feel like there was no choice in having to provide care, which sometimes there's not, that can add a lot more stress. And then the closer your relationship is with the person you're providing care for. So it might be different for an aunt as compared to your child. But in these different areas, caregivers, the physical strain, so it could be uh, very clear cut, like helping someone transfer, that can be hard on your back. Um, uh, caregivers are more likely to get short term and long term illnesses like the flu or chronic conditions. Um, they experience emotional distress. Sometimes it can be very isolating as a caregiver. That's why we have support groups to try and help with some of that. And then the financial pressure as well. Um, specifically, if you're caregiving for more hours a week and you may have to quit your job or take time off, uh, that can affect your income. 
So here's a little uh, assessment, and you can answer these to yourself in your head for now. Um, but it can be difficult to recognize when caregiving starts to be stressful, and it can also be hard to um, be honest with ourselves when it's getting stressful. But when caregivers are stressed, more mistakes can be made, um, and they just have more difficulty providing that, that wonderful care. So here are some um, questions. So feeling angry or sad, feeling like it's more than you can handle, which is absolutely true. Caregiving is not just for one person. It's a team effort. Uh, feeling like you don't have time for yourself, and we'll get into that more. Sleeping too much or too little. Having trouble eating or eating too much. And then losing interest in things you used to enjoy. Um, so self-care has been a hot topic to talk about, and I think it's wonderful to do that, and it's also very important to remember that taking care of yourself is not just something else on your to-do list, um, and that we need to involve a lot of other folks when we want to take care of ourselves. So this uh, includes healthy eating, getting enough sleep, making sure you exercise, even that if that's a walk around the block. Uh, following up with your own medical provider, so that way your health isn't deteriorating well. Um, we have many support groups and counseling options. Me time. This is my dog, Luke. Uh, that's my me time. We go on walks, so we get our exercise in, and uh, he he's always very positive with me, so I, I appreciate that. And then this big one, which has come up again at the in the other presentations, ask for help. We can't help you if we don't know what's going on, and so the more you can communicate with us, the more we can come up with solutions to what's happening. Uh, in the front, there were a couple different worksheets out there. If you didn't grab them, that's all right. Uh, there's plenty more if you'd like some, but I'll just read the titles and read a little bit into it. So one is, is your lifestyle causing you stress? They have some negative self-care behaviors. And those could include using tobacco products, drinking a lot of coffee, which I think many of us are guilty of, uh, drinking alcohol, angry outbursts, watching too much television. So those are some ways we might cope with the stress, but they're not always the healthiest for us. They also have some positive self-care behaviors, which include engaging in physical activity, so walking your dog counts, uh, getting lots of sleep, maintaining a sense of humor, play, and rewarding yourself for your accomplishments, which I think many of us miss that. There's also a self-care assessment, and this one's a little bit longer. It's two pages, um, and this one I actually did when I was in social work school, and I found it to be very helpful at the time, and I still keep it in mind today. But they have different areas um, to review to take care of yourself. So physical self-care, that's Pretty obvious, we've talked about that. Psychological self-care. Um, this can be taking day trips, make time away from electronics, write in a journal, read literature that's unrelated to work. Emotional self-care, spend time with others whose company I enjoy, reread favorite books, allow myself to cry, and find things that make me laugh. There's also spiritual self-care, which I find very important. Um, make time for reflection, spend time in nature, find a spiritual community, um, pray, meditate, and sing. And then relationship self-care, so schedule regular dates with your partner or spouse, make time to reply to personal emails and letters, and then ask for help when I need it. So again, that one's coming up. And then there's also a section for workplace and professional self-care. But you can read a little bit more about these um, later. And then you can rank yourself, and there's a little score. So if you're into that, that's what that's there for. And then there's also a maintenance and self-care plan worksheet. And this is something that I can be more helpful with one-on-one. -on -one, but if you're looking to make more of these changes um, in, embedded in your life, this is just a more detailed worksheet, and I can kind of walk you through those processes as well. So back to what social workers do, we address non-medical barriers to health. Uh, we can help with caregivers, homemakers, family members can be paid caregivers, um, long-term care, insurance, transportation, 
connecting with other providers. So that may be um, moving all your care to Rush or moving your care outside of Rush. If you're finding a PCP, if you need a therapist, if you're looking for home health companies. Uh, again, the behavior modification that was brought up already. Uh, mental health support, which I'll talk about a little more. And then advanced directive. So out at the front as well, there's a healthcare power of attorney form. You probably can't see it, but it looks like this. It has a little barcode on top. This is Rush's form. So if you want to take it and talk it over with your family and friends and bring it back to us, uh, Krista and I or Dr. Hall can help you complete it if you have any questions. Um, but those are really important so that way family members know what they would like um, in the event that something happens. And along those lines, we also have the five wishes packet. And this is something I can go over more in depth with uh, folks individually. We ran out this morning, but we can order some more and get those to people if you need it. But the five wishes are the person I want to make care decisions for me when I can't, the kind of medical treatment I want or don't want, how comfortable I want to be, how I want people to treat me, and what I want my loved ones to know. So these are really difficult conversations to have, um, as many of you know already. But it's important to write down what you or what your loved one wants ahead of time, so that way it's easier for the folks um, who are taking care of you to make those decisions, knowing that they'll align with your values. Uh, and that goes with end of life decisions. And then also, all the care management services we would provide for patients, I can also help with for caregivers. And a few other things that were out there. Uh, the crisis template, this is from HDSA. I think it goes well along with the cards, but they just talk a little bit about if something were to happen, if you're walking around, um, people have these so that way they know what's going on and who your doctor is. So those are out in the front too. Um, and then, Getting more into mental health, Rush has a whole host of mental health options for folks. So we have individual counseling that could be with some of our psychologists in the clinic, but also other social workers here. Um, we have a general emotional wellness group for caregivers, as well as our uh, HD specific one that I will start running uh, in two weekends. So the 26th, which is also a Saturday, it will be here in the tower if you're interested. And HDSA also has a lot of wonderful online support groups, and you can ask Emily Zivin, our social worker from the chapter, more about those. And we have a caregiver initiative, Rush Generations programming, those were all those flyers out there, but they have lots of lectures and workshops that you can attend. So mental health and depression in older adults and caregivers, the sandwich generation, caregiving for children and parents, different things like that. Um, and then that self-care wellness plan. So those were the the worksheets that were out there that I explained a little earlier. We can talk more about that together and kind of come up with a plan if you need someone to bounce ideas off of besides family and friends, so a third party. And that's the end of my presentation, but I just want to say that we really appreciate our caregivers and we want to make sure that you're healthy and well supported just as much as our patients here at Rush because you're super uh, important to our care team as a whole and we really appreciate you. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, questions. If you have any questions, you can also email me or call me. I have my cards out front. Okay, so I just wanted to make an announcement. If you did not get validation and you parked in the parking garage, please see someone at the front desk to get one of these little yellow chasers to put in after your card to pay for your parking today. So the next speaker I'd like to introduce is Jeffrey Rabin, who uh, we're very fortunate to have today is a specialist in disability law. And we get lots of questions in the clinic about this and he's going to orient us and tell us everything we need to know.
Hello. You've got to use the mic because we can't hear you in the back. Okay. Can you hear me better now? All right. I'm sorry. So I was asked to, to come here and be the lawyer. I put on the lawyer's costume. You all have seen me in the lawyer's costume. I actually hate the lawyer's costume. So if you don't mind. How do I move this? Oh, here we go. There we go. Got it. So my name is Jeff Rabin, and all I do in my law practice is help people who are disabled and are trying to get benefits from the Social Security Administration. I became a lawyer in 1980 and started out downtown with a small general practice firm where I got stuck with the social security work because nobody else wanted to deal with the clientele or this bureaucracy. As time went on, I found I liked the clientele and I liked the bureaucracy a whole lot more than I like other lawyers. And the nice thing about my work is I don't have to deal with them. It's me, my client, and the judge, and off we go. I did my first disability case in 1981 I set up my own law firm in 1988 just to do Social Security disability work. I do this all over the country. I talk to groups like this all over the country. I've testified before Congress. I was even a bad guy on a 60 Minutes episode because I believe people with substance abuse deserve help. Leslie Stahl didn't. She won. I lost. But it was kind of an interesting experience. So this is my thing. This talk that I normally give on Social Security disability is 90 minutes long, and they gave me 30. So two things are going to happen. We're not going to cover the entire handout, but the handout is important, and I have to leave out some of my jokes. So but we're going to try to get through as much as we can. So what I want to cover this morning is I first want to define for you what it means to be totally disabled, because that phrase has a legal meaning and it's important. I want to talk about what SSDI is and what SSI is and what the differences are, because that's important for family planning. Then I want to talk about how Social Security act actually treats Huntington's disease and what you need to do in order to be able to get these benefits. If I do this right, you all will never have to call me because you'll be able to do this on your own. So let's see if we can get that done. All right, so page three of the handout. What does it mean to be totally disabled? In order for me to get somebody Social Security benefits, I've got to prove the existence of permanent medical impairment produced in so severe precludes a bit of performing substantial gainful activity for a period that's lasted expect the last 12 months or result in death. See, this lady was going to write that down. And that's a lot of legal mumble jumble. Here's what it means. In order for me to get somebody benefits, I have to be able to prove that they are suffering from symptoms which so impact their day-to-day -day life that they could not function at any kind of job available in the national economy for a period that's already lasted or expected to last 12 months or result in death in 12 months. So the focus in a disability case is not on the diagnosis. People with Huntington's do work, especially in the very beginning. People with cancer work, people with AIDS work, people with multiple sclerosis work. So the focus is not on whether my clients have a label, the focus in Social Security disability cases are what are the symptoms from that label and how does the evidence, and we're going to come to this word proof and evidence in a minute, how does the evidence document how those symptoms impact their ability to function? So if somebody calls me and they have a physical medical problem, a bad back, a bad heart, a breathing problem, Huntington's, how do the symptoms impact the physical motions of working? How does it affect sitting in a chair? How does it affect standing? How does it affect walking? How does it affect lifting and reaching and pushing and pulling? Those physical motions involved in every job, how are they impacted by the symptoms from whatever that physical medical problem is? Somebody calls me up and they have a mental impairment, major depressive disorder, um, anxiety disorder, anorexia, PTSD, agoraphobia. The most common call we get is bipolar. What are the symptoms of the mental impairment? And how do those symptoms impact the basic mental motions of work? 
Understanding and remembering simple instructions, interacting appropriately with supervisors and coworkers, dealing with changes in work settings and work stress. These basic mental motions involved in every job, how are they impacted by the symptoms from whatever the diagnosis happens to be? See, Social Security rarely disagrees with the diagnosis. If a guy's got a scar six, six inches down the middle of his back, he had a back fusion. Social Security's not going to say he didn't. What they're going to say is, so what? He had a back fusion. What can he do despite that back fusion? And they call this in their lingo, your residual functional capacity to perform work-related activities. What you can still do on a full-time basis despite your medical problems. And they develop an RFC for every single person that applies. In fact, by the time you see a judge, they usually have five different RFCs that they've developed through the course of your case. And then they take that RFC and they relate it to the mythical world of work. Let's understand, this is not a reality-based program. It does not matter in this law whether you could get a job or whether anyone would hire you, or whether the jobs you still retain the RFC to perform pay a living wage. None of that's going to be considered, especially for people under 50, slightly at 50 if you don't have a GED, slightly more at 55, but not in a significant way. Let's take an example. Let's take a 49-year-old Chicago carpenter climbing the scaffold, scaffold tips, falls, crashes on him, he herniates two discs in the low back, and he needs a back fusion. Now, as a union Chicago carpenter, he was making $43 an hour um, plus benefits. He's never going to be a $43 an hour carpenter again because he's not going to be able to bend and saw all day and do the tasks of a carpenter. But that's not the test. Social Security is a total disability test. So the question in that case is can I prove that he could not function as a ticket taker at a movie theater. Wear a little blue jacket, sit stand option in the chair, rip the tickets in half, door number two, enjoy the show. Shoebox packer in a shoe store, washing machine unloader in a laundromat, coin changer at a self-service gas station. These are the kinds of jobs that Social Security will identify to try to deny clients benefits. A number of years ago, I represented a cardiac intensive care nurse here in Chicago, zapping people with you know, EKGs, saving lives, and all those things we see on TV. She developed rheumatoid arthritis and had two claw hands. Social Security denied her application, saying she had the RFC to be a bicycle rental clerk. Um, back when you could help substance abusers, I was very active in the substance abuse community. I was a consultant with Gateway Foundation. I was representing one of their um, clients who was in a year-long treatment facility, they denied his application because they said he retained the RFC to be a bank vault security guard. Now, when I told Henry the heroin addict they wanted him to guard the bank vault, he said, Mr. Rabin, I wish how I wish. The point of the stories is the nurse was never going to go right, rent bikes. Henry was never going to get a job in a bank. But that's not the test. Test is whether I could prove they could not function at those kinds of jobs. So if you want to remember one word, and I have it on this desk that looks like mine and makes poor Charlene groan every morning, one word to remember that covers everything I've talked about so far is the word do, D-O. Social Security's not going to deny you have a disease. They're going to argue or research or try to determine what you can still do despite your disease. Now, this basic law, proving the inability to function in a job, applies to two different programs. And let's talk, oh gosh, this is so nice it works. Um, let's talk about them. The first program is called Title II of the Social Security Act, Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI, Workers' Disability, We'll call it SSDI. The second program is Title 16 of the Social Security Act, Supplemental Security Income, or SSI. We'll call it SSI. So we have SSDI, SSI. Let's talk about SSDI first because it's more comprehensive. It has two requirements. 
First, we have to prove you're totally disabled. Second, you must have bought the insurance. And this is a misconception people have. Social Security is not a charity program. This is not a we feel sorry for you program. SSDI is a program you worked and purchased, just like you purchase your homeowner's insurance and you purchase your car insurance and you purchase your life insurance. You do this the same way. And you do it by working and getting a paycheck. And all of you see you got a lot of lines on your paycheck. Well, the lines in the middle, um, there are a couple of you all here with some gray hair, so you'll remember when they did say FICA. It doesn't say FICA anymore. I'm pointing to you with the gray hair. Um, now it says OASDI and Medicare, but combined, those are your FICA payments. And that's the money that's taken out of your paycheck. The boss matches it dollar for dollar. She reaches into her purse. So every dollar taken out of your check for FICA, she reaches into her purse. The money gets sent out to Washington, D.C., and it goes into the Social Security Trust Funds. The big trust fund that eats up most of the money is Social Security Retirement. Then there's a little one off to the side, and little's in the billion, so we're talking relative here, is called Social Security Disability, and the other one on the other side is called Medicare. And that's how these programs are funded. What's your name? Chris works, and he sends in his FICA dollars. They're matched by the boss, and that money goes in, and then it's immediately paid out. So those of you on disability, or those of you who have parents on retirement, or grandparents on retirement, or know somebody getting survivor's benefits. They're getting the money Chris and the boss sent in last month. And then whatever at the end of the month is left over, the trust funds loan to the United States Treasury so that they could lie to us about the size of the federal deficit. Because if they ever factored in the deficit and the debt to the Social Security trust funds, nobody would have any faith in the U.S. economy anymore. So all of you who are getting benefits or know people who are, make sure they have Chris's email and send him a thank you every month for continuing to make his FICA payments. To qualify for SSDI, you have to meet a two-part FICA test. One, you had to have worked 40 quarters in your lifetime. Second, you must have worked and paid FICA taxes for five out of the 10 years prior to the date you became totally disabled. Their lingo, 20 quarters of the 40 quarters preceding the onset of disability. So let's take an example. Melissa made me get dressed up today. You learn a lot about me in these talks. My life's pretty much an open book. Um, I'm the world's biggest klutz. And part of the problem with me, in fact, even walking up here, I spilled my stuff and some poor guy's chasing stress balls around the hospital for me. Um, I had to wear shoes with ties. I trip on my shoes on the way out of here. They all get concerned. They rush me up to MRI. They do an MRI and say, oh, my God, he's more brain damaged than when he got to the conference. And now I'm totally disabled. I live up in Lake County. I go to Waukegan. The first thing they do is contact my IRS and pull my earnings record. Have I worked 40 quarters in my life? I've now worked more than 40 years, so I got that covered. Then they pull my earnings record from 2008 through 2018. 10 years prior to the year I became totally disabled, have I worked and paid FICA taxes at least 20 quarters during that time period? I've only worked for two years or 14 quarters, or I worked for cash and never paid the man a dime, I'll have screwed myself because I wouldn't have purchased the insurance. If I'm totally disabled, worked and paid my FICA taxes, I'll get SSDI benefits. The average person on SSDI is supporting her family on about $1,250 a month. Kids under 16 will get benefits, and I get the Medicare card, the federal red, white, and blue health insurance card after I've been disabled for 29 months. Second program for people who don't qualify for SSDI because they haven't worked and paid into the system is called Title 16 of the Social Security Act, or SSI. SSI has two requirements also. Number one, you must be totally disabled. Number two, you must be indigent. Indigent for SSI purposes means no money coming into the household and less than $2,000 in non-excludable resources. So what do we mean by non-excludable resources? You're allowed a house. As long as you're living in it, you don't have to be homeless to get SSI. You're allowed one car because you have to get to Dr. Hall's office. They won't value your clothes. 
But they will look in your purse. They will look inside your wallet. They will look for bank accounts, savings accounts, IRAs, 401ks, 203bs, cash value life insurance, investment properties, poorly drafted family trusts, any asset that can be converted to cash, even if you have to pay a tax or a penalty to access it, counts against the $2,000 limitation. So SSI is a program for people who are totally disabled with very limited financial resources. Now, I have a whole long deeming story that I'm going to cut out because I don't want to use my time up with it. But the, one of the problems with assets and income testing in SSI is deeming. So I'm going to pick again on Chris and the nice lady next to him. I'm going to make some assumptions. If I'm wrong, please don't get mad at me. But Chris is sitting there with this very nice lady. And what the deeming says is what belongs to Chris belongs to his wife. What belongs to his wife belongs to him. What belongs to the two of them belongs to their minor children. Typical story is the stay-at-home mom. So we're going to pick on Chris's wife, and I'm just, again, making assumptions. Don't get mad at me. Um, Chris's wife hasn't worked. She gets really sick. She wants to get SSI because she hasn't paid into the system, but they're running out of money because of her medical bills. She can't get it because Chris is working. His assets and income, his 401K, his, daily, his weekly check are all considered to be um, his wife's. Therefore, because of deeming, she's not indigent, and she'll be denied SSI benefits. The meaning of deeming in the United States is that stay-at-home moms or stay-at-home parents get screwed, because that's the most common scenario. And this country that puts this huge emphasis on family values puts zero value on a parent staying home to raise children who later get sick and then can't get help or access the health care system. So it's a huge problem, not going to be addressed in the near future. Okay, so people who are totally disabled may get SSDI, may get SSI. How does Social Security actually think about cases? Because they do think about cases. And in the regulations, that's the fine print. So we talk about the law, and then the law is defined by regulations. The regulations are redefined by the palms and the hallux. Those are reinterpreted by the rulings, and then the federal courts change everything again. So there's lots of law in this little niche area. But in the regulations is an analytical framework used by every single decision maker. Adjudicators, judges, appeals counsel, federal court, everybody analyzes cases exactly the same way. They call it in the regulations the sequential evaluation procedure. I'm a roofer's kid. I became a lawyer because I was so bad at roofing, they threw me out of the family business. I can only say sequential evaluation procedure twice in a day, and my tongue goes on strike. So instead, I talk about climbing a ladder. because That's how I grew up, with the ladders rattling in the back of my dad's Pontiac and the smell of hot tar, which to me is still the greatest smell in the whole world. The first step on the ladder is the one I want to talk about. It's actually the ground floor before you even get on the ladder. And it's called Compassionate Allowances. About 10 years ago, we finally had a good commissioner. We haven't had a good commissioner before or since. But his name was Ken Astru. And what Commissioner Astru said is, you know what? There are some cases where things have progressed far enough that we know we're going to pay them every single time. And if we're going to pay them every single time, why are we putting people through all these hoops? Just send them the benefits. So they started out with 50 conditions. It's now up to about 225 conditions. And if you have one of these conditions, your benefits application should be expedited. By their guidelines, it should be paid in 10 days, but Social Security barely blinks once in 10 days. But it does happen much more quickly if you have a compassion and allowance condition. Adult Huntington's disease is a compassionate allowance condition. It's in the list of cases or applications that should get special treatment. So if you have worked enough to qualify for SSDI or you meet the asset and income limitations for SSI and you have progressive Huntington's disease and you and your doctors agree that, hey, this has gotten to the point where you can't work, Take a letter from the doctor explaining 
that you have this condition and generally what the symptoms are, go to the Social Security office. It's much better here to go to the office. The best way to go to the office, you go at 8.30 in the morning with a friend. You go at 8.30 because the office opens at 9. And you don't want to get there at 9 because there's a three-hour wait. So you get there at 8.30 and you bring a friend because Social Security bureaucrats are busy and they're stressed and sometimes not in a good mood. So you want somebody with you who's not on a lot of medications, who understands what's going on, to be able to have a little better dialogue and also to be able to witness and explain what's going on. When you go to the person, you say, compassionate allowance, and feet should come running and everything should go pretty smoothly and your benefit should be approved. That's how it works in the best of times because of our time considerations and because most cases with Huntington's will get paid at the compassionate allowance level. I don't wanna go through all the different steps. If I come out to a group and we have more time, we can go through all the steps, but we won't have to do that today because I wanna to get to the next slide that I wanna deal with and that's here. All right, now I realize after doing this talk for many, many, many years, but I got to a certain point and I've sort of stressed everybody out a little bit, um, including myself. So Melissa, if you can help me for a second. I have my box here. I'll keep talking while we're helping everybody be stressed. Whoops. So you don't get benefits because you have a label. Even in the Compassion and Allowance Guidelines for Huntington's Disease, the regulations are looking for evidence of progression of the symptoms. So what is evidence and how do we prove a case? So now I'm going to pick first on you. What's your name? Karen. When, Candy, I'm sorry. When Candy comes to my office, one of the things I'm going to tell her is what she says to Social Security about her problems is not evidence because she wants the money. As far as Social Security is concerned, Candy would testify under oath that I still had that full head of curly brown hair that I used to have um, if that would get her $1,000 a month. So what she says can never be evidence to win a case. What her sister says or her mother says or her husband says or her best friend says, oh my gosh, Candy, it's so bad. I'm watching what's happening to her. This is terrible. That's not evidence because they like her. The only thing that's evidence in a social security disability application, did you get one? Are the records of the treating medical specialist. So rule number one, you must be going to the doctor. You must be going to the doctor. You must be going to the doctor. I cannot say it enough. These are medical cases that turn on medical charts, medical notes, medical findings. If you're not going to the doctor, there is no evidence. I hate the analogy that a lot of people like to use about their lawyers being their gunslinger going to fight for them. Honestly, I've never shot a gun in my life except a BB gun when I was a kid. I wouldn't know how to shoot a gun. Well, maybe a rifle because I like John Wayne movies and I've seen him do it. But I can't, I don't shoot bullets. I shoot MRI reports. I shoot neuropsychological evaluations. I shoot Beck depression inventories and physical therapy charts. And if you're not, go, did everybody get one or still passing them out? Um, you wanna grab some more? Um, if you're not going to the doctor, I have no bullets. If I have no bullets, I have no evidence. If I have no evidence, you will not get awarded benefits. Rule number two. And now we're going to pick on, we'll pick on you. You're sitting up here in the front. What's your name? Jeannie. So one of the advantages I have up front is that I've been able to see that Jeannie has this really nice smile. You all in the back can't see. Now she's getting embarrassed and now she's, she's going to use it. So I, I told you all that I was a roofer's kid and my brothers and I were blessed. We had wonderful parents, learned a lot. 
They've both been gone for many, many, many years, but think about them every day. And I learned a lot from my dad. He was a tough guy. He'd be up there on the roof, and he'd be using the hatchet. He'd be chopping off the old roof. And remember, I told you I'm a klutz. Well, I inherited that from him. So whack, he'd hit his arm with the hatchet instead of the roof, and he'd put a gash in his arm. But the job had to get done. So he'd spit on it, he'd put a glob of tar on it, and he'd close it off, and he'd go home. My dad never complained. Never complained. He took care of his family, he took care of his parents, did everything he had to do. My dad was not a complainer. The other thing about my dad, he was the world's biggest flirt. I mean, my dad flirted all the time. And I can't tell you how many times my brothers and I and my mom would be outside a restaurant and she'd be stomping her foot on the sidewalk and smoking that cigarette that killed her at 58, um, waiting for my dad. She thought he was paying the cashier. He was playing with the cashier. And that was my dad and I kind of inherited I've been, oh, perfect. I kind of inherited that from him. And I'm a pretty good flirt. And my first wife didn't get to like it so much. My second wife, she kind of understands. It's okay. It's cool. Now, Jeannie, right? She's my psychiatrist. And she's been treating me for a long time. And she kind of knows me. And I like her smile. And today's my day for an appointment with Dr. Jeannie. So I do today what you all do. Every one of you does this when you go to the doctor. You take a shower, you put on a clean shirt, maybe trim what can be trimmed, I pat down what's left to be patted down. I'm not a whiner or a complainer, I got that from my dad, I wanna see her smile, I walk into her office, she says, hi Jeff, how are you today? And I answer her the same way you all do, you all do this, I'm okay doc, how are you? What does she chart? Well groomed, nice man says he's okay and I just lost my disability case. Next month I come in. Now the shirt's a little wrinkled and the eyes are red and I have this thing that the psychologists call a flat affect. I, I always think of the iron thing in Monopoly, but I think it means I look sad. And I walk into Dr. Jeannie's office and she says, Jeff, any new symptoms? Maybe we need to adjust your medications. Well, those of you who deal with or work with people with mental illness, you know the worst thing you can say to somebody is I wanna change your medications because People hate the ups and downs and ups and downs with medication changes. Oh, no, 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 Dr. Jeannie, really things are okay. Uh, it's just a bad week. The dog pooped on the carpeting and the kid had a problem at the school, but there are no new symptoms. What does she chart? Jeff says no new symptoms. Next week I come in, now I'm a mess. The clothes are all wrinkled. I haven't showered. She kind of has to grab that Febreze bottle under her desk when I walk in. She's really concerned about me. Hey, Jeff, are you sure things are stable? Maybe we need to talk about that um, intensive outpatient program over at Rush Hospital. What do I hear? Hospital. I've been in those mental health hospitals. They're bad. No, 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 no. Really, really, I'm stable. It was, I had to go to the principal, and then I punched him, but it wasn't my fault. It was his fault, but really, things are stable. What does she say right in her chart? Jeff says he's stable. Social Security reads every chart from every medical professional that you see. Doctors, social workers, therapists, OBGYNs, it doesn't, well, if Chris goes to an OBGYN, it's a problem. But everyone else, they will read every single chart. What are they going to read in Dr. Genie's? Jeff says he's stable. Jeff says no new symptoms. Jeff says he's okay. Case denied. Rule number two. When you go to the doctor, tell the truth. Okay? Yeah. You're not going to the doctor because you're okay. You're not considering filing for disability because you're okay. In fact, it's wonderful for doctors to hear how good you're doing, but truly it's not why you're there. You're there to have your problems solved. Now, outside there's a lot of tchotchkes and things that we left for you guys, but one of the more important ones is this calendar. And you'll see it's got big boxes on every day. And we give this to every client. I left enough out there, I think, for almost everybody. Write your symptoms down. I tell people, put this on your nightstand. And at the end of the day, before you go to sleep, talk about whether you got out of bed that day or whether you fell or whether you went off on your spouse for no reason at all. If you want your spouse's help, leave it by the toaster oven. 
And then when you go to see Dr. Hall or any other doctor, bring with this with you, and then you're a better communicator to the doctor. Two things happen. Number one, you get better medical care because the doctor's hearing more truth. Number two, the charts are accurate and I can get you help. Rule number three here, specialists. Family doctors have a very limited role to play in social security cases. So if you have Huntington's, it's the neurologist and it's the social worker and it's the mental health people because almost all of these chronic conditions result in depression and anxiety because your life just gets tossed upside down. Must be going to the doctor, must be communicating with the doctor, and must be going to the right doctors. If you're doing those things, you'll be generating the evidence you need for your case, and when you and the treating neurologist and the treating specialist agree that it's time to stop working, then it's time to file for social security disability. The rest of the handout covers a lot of different material um, and a lot of different areas of the law. Review it. Never hesitate to contact my office, even if you just have general questions. Either get myself or Kelly or Susan. We don't charge to answer questions. Um, if you think it's a compassion allowance case, we can either help you do it or we can walk you through how to do it yourself, and we're happy to do that. This is an incredible group that Rush has put together. I mean, you don't find this hardly anywhere with such a wide variety of support and resources. I am totally impressed by the work I've been able to do with them over the years. You're very blessed to have these people. Thank you for letting me come out here today. And if there's any questions while we're getting the panel set up, I can answer questions or I'll hang around for a little bit. So the question is, is there a limit for how long you'd be on disability? So the answer is sort of yes. When you hit retirement age, you move from disability to the retirement trust fund. The other limit is if you improve. So if Social Security does what they call a continuing disability review and finds that you've had medical improvement sufficient to allow you to return to work, then your benefits may be terminated. So the key is even if you're on Social Security, keep seeing the doctor and keep communicating because that communication is what makes the difference. Thanks everybody.